Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this uh, Brian Lovell conference. It's the second uh, Brian Lovell conference we've held, and this is a new flagship series, flagship meeting series for the Geological Society that we started this time last year. Um, and we've had a number of long-running conference series here. This one is, for, for us as an organisation, distinctive and a bit new in putting societal problems at the heart of a conference and at the heart of a conference series. Uh, and rather than looking at areas of geology and then maybe where those might have applications if it's a more applied conference, taking as our starting point some of the big societal challenges and then thinking how we can draw on our science and on other disciplines to address these problems. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to open this conference on mining for the future and what that will look like, particularly in the context of uh, meeting the objectives set in the Paris COP21 emissions targets uh, and achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, I, over the next couple of days, we're going to be tackling a very big question, and we've tried to break this down, myself and uh, my fellow conveners, Edmund Nicholas, Francis Wall, uh, Andrew Bloodworth and Natalia Yakovleva, we recognise that we've taken on a pretty impossible task to try and tackle this question over two days, but we've got a really fantastic, wide-ranging set of talks, and we've allowed plenty of time for discussion as well. And I hope in those discussions we can start to fill in the gaps a little bit, not try and do everything, but as it were, um, do put in some of the glue which will join up uh, talks which can't, can't, by definition, cover the entire territory. This conference is also the sort of opener for 2018 as far as the Geological Society is concerned because 2018 we have designated our year of resources. So we've had these scientific themes for the year over the last couple of years and they've been really useful stimuli for particularly explore, exploring new areas which we wouldn't necessarily historically have explored at the Geological Society and in stimulating interesting partnerships and interdisciplinary work. So I think a lot of the things which we pick up or that emerge over the next two days will get picked up here in the society over the next year or so. I just overheard that um, David is going to be mentioning lithium in his talk, and I know that at least one other speaker will talk about lithium. We're going to be having a conference on lithium uh, in April, so many of these strands will get picked up later. And a particular thing to think about feeding into is that there is a major international conference in Vancouver next year in June called Resources for Future Generations. Uh, and certainly uh, I and Edmund and the other conveners will be thinking about things we can take from this conference and, and take there and how th that interacts with that conference. So that's more than enough from me probably, but it's a great pleasure to see you all here. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce our opening speaker for, the, for this initial session where we'll be looking at uh, demand trends and, and sort of global supply trends, but supply and demand to set the scene for the rest of the conference. It's a great pleasure to, to welcome our first keynote speaker, Peter Buchholz, who is director of DERA, the German Mineral Resources Agency. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you for the invitation to this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, in space, our planet Earth is something somehow very special. At night, it gives light, which is um, like a star, which is very unusual for planets, actually, if you ask astronomers. But it's because of us who switch on these lights on our planet. This light is pure electric power, and um, this power is either from fossil fuel or maybe in future time a bit more from renewable energy sources. And certainly with lightening this planet, global demand for energy and energy resources will dramatically or massively increase. That is for sure. And hopefully, also for Africa, I'm sure in this century, Africa will switch on their lights as well. 
Now, look at the United States of America. Um, very bright in light. Well, only half of it, but anyway, for some reasons. Look at Europe. Europe in 1992 and 2010. It's, I, I would say it's double of the energy produced there or consumed there. Lightning very, very bright. Look at China. China in the year 1992, 2010. Dramatic increase of um, China, 92, 2010. Dramatic in uh, increase of uh, energy consumption. And to 2030, the power electric consumption will probably triple in China. And with the Silk Road project, the new Silk Road project extending to the east, uh, to the west, um, this picture will probably change a lot in 10 or 20 years' time. And surprisingly, or maybe not, look at India. Very bright, highly electrified. And we'll look at resource consumption later on. Now, energy is the driver for industrialization. And industrialization happened basically in the UK in the 19th century. It peaked in the 19th century. It was followed on the verge of the 20th century by Germany um, extending infrastructure, building, manufacturing, but sad enough, um, also in, in war uh, and, and war machinery. Industrialization followed actually in the United States and peaked in the 1940s and 1950s in the construction industry, in the car manufacturing, more modernized manufacturing processes. And finally, uh, not finally, but then followed by Japan. Industrialization in Japan occurred between the 1960s and the 1970s, or starting in the 50s, it's processes of a couple of decades. But now, finally, um, the last major industrialization phase is with China, and it still carries on. So industrialization consumes energy but also um, mineral resources. And let's put it in some numbers. These are time series starting in, the 19, in 1850 uh, to 2010, and it shows the share of global consumption for um, a basket of aluminum, steel, copper, zinc, and tin, <coughs> because you get time series for only these commodities, basically. And as you see, Great Britain has a almost 40% share of global demand of global consumption for these commodities in the 19th century, peaking in the 19th century, followed by Germany on the verge to the 20th century, then followed massively by the United States. The industrialization in the United States dominated the 20th century, followed by Japan, not a major, such a major impact. And now we got the BRIC states, but only China <coughs> has taken off until 2010, consuming about 40% of global consumption for these commodities, basically what the UK consumed in the 19th century as a share of global production. We, as part of our DERA, uh, DERA, by the way, is part of the German Geological Survey, the Federal Institute of Geoscience and Natural Resources. So within DERA, we monitor uh, demand, supply, and price trends. And part of our monitoring is also to look at uh, consumption, consumption growth in developing industrialized countries. This is a bit small, but I just want to show you that we've, we've, we've extended the time series to 2015, 1850 to 2015, and you see that there's no major change for the industrialized countries, um, United States, Great Britain, Japan, Germany, um, and, but China is still extending their share on the global demand, up to 50% of 
consumption for these commodities. Uh, actually, this is uh, uh, an extract for copper and for aluminium. And there's almost no sign from India because we were very interesting to see what is happening in India. As you saw the bright lights in India, when does industrialization really pick up in India? Because that probably is the next candidate for the next industrialization phase. So you see India on the bottom here is uh, starting to increase, but we, after five years, we don't see any major signs. But it will come, maybe taking another five to ten years. As you see, China, um, China uh, speeded up at when they had a share of about 10% of global consumption, then it rapidly increases. So maybe that's going to happen in India, although the whole society system, government system, the structure of land and ownership is totally different to China. But anyway, we have to keep our eyes open. Now, industrialization is not only um, consume, consuming energy, um, it is also consuming um, mineral raw materials. Mineral raw materials for the advancing um, energy transition towards renewable, uh, renewable energy. And if you just look the, at the electric power production, the bulk actually is dominated by hydropower, and um, we're not considering here um, coal and, and, and wood. Um, it's not used for electric power production, but contributes a lot to the, to the whole uh, energy consumption anyway. So in, these, uh, in this picture, you do see um, the um, energy global installed renewable and electric power capacity for wind, solar, biopower, um, and geothermal, and so on. And as you can see, the biggest share is for wind power and for solar um, photovoltaic uh, electricity. So let's have a look at the solar uh, photovoltaic energy power capacity. It dramatically increases while coming from a very low share of um, total power production, but it increases dramatically. And again, China is, has the biggest growth, although also the other countries have a, have a quite significant rise in, in demand for solar energy. And uh, at least for solar energy, it's quite distributed. The, the, the growth pattern is distributed all over the world. For wind, globally installed wind electric power capacity 2006 to 2016 is also dramatically increasing, um, coming up to almost 500 uh, gigawatts uh, out of these total 900 gigawatts totally installed uh, renewable energy power capacity. Now, what are the um, mineral raw materials that are needed for these renewable energy technologies? For solar, it is a bunch of group of these minor metals, um, and they will have an impact to the market. The underlined ones are those ones we think are important to consider. There's a lot more to consider on you know, construction materials. Same for wind energy, um, rare earth elements, um, copper, but also a whole bunch of other materials, including quartz, kaolin, feldspar for the, for the rotors, and um, gravel, limestone, stuff for construction. Then uh, energy storage facilities for um, for the energy transition, lithium, cobalt, graphite, nickel, manganese, aluminium, but also vanadium, um, energy storage for grids, grid system, electricity grid system has not been, has almost nothing applied at the moment, and it's very difficult to, to, to give a foresight for that development, but it will probably also come. 
and electric grids and transmission, including digitalization, aluminium and copper, are not to forget in all these scenarios. So let's have a look a bit in more detail what's happening in the um, what's happening when 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 the networks are increasing to build up. You certainly need aluminium and copper, and we always look at the market concentration um, of these mineral raw materials, market concentration of global production, here shown with the Helfendahl Hirschmann index, which is um, which is an index used by the con competitive authorities, and wherever the green flags are coming up, the market is quite diversified. Yellow is moderate market concentration, and uh, red is a red flag. It's a very high market concentration with low, with only a few suppliers in the market, and the um, the World Bank, the the weighted. World Bank country risk um, of medium risk. But then for aluminium, for copper, mine production, the situation, the mining situation, the market concentration is pretty relaxed. But for at least aluminium smelter production, the major producer is China, standing out, followed by Russia and Canada. So I'd say for copper and aluminium, situation relatively relaxed, but with the quantities that uh, some companies are, uh, have foresights for, um, it really becomes um, a question whether the mining industry is capable to, to produce these quantities. We talk about 23 million tons of refined copper production for the minor metals, for solar and wind. We talk about 110,000 or 200,000 tons of production uh, of rare earth elements, and for the minor metals like indium, gallium, it's all below 1,000 tons annual production. So for copper and aluminium, we talk about complete different numbers, quantities. And there's a scenario just been published in my in mining journal in November that for the um, the electromobility um, coming from 10 million cars. EV cars to maybe 50 million EV cars in 2050, the impact uh, might be around six, six and a half thousand, uh, six and a half million tons additional copper that is needed, coming from 23 million tons additional six and a half million uh, to maybe 2030. There are some more certain scenarios around, and I picked only one of them. Uh, from the Warren Center uh, for Advanced Technology in Australia, and they had, an, they had an, an interesting survey looking at the copper demand for demographic and economic growth by urbanization, um, increase of wealth and in infrastructure, buildings in India, China, um, may account for an additional 5.8 or 3.2 million tons of copper uh, until 2030. Electricity and clean power may account solar PV for 6.5 million, wind 3.6, and then clean transport, the light EVs as mentioned, maybe 6.5, 6.5 million tons, additional tons for copper, high speed rail, urban rail, electric buses, which are very often forgot in the EV discussion, um, current EV discu discussion. And they come to the conclusion that some additional 30 million tons of copper would be necessary to, uh, within the next 15 years. This is more than double of today's, um, or this is, this is double, this is today's, more than today's uh, global copper production of 23 million tons. Well, this is probably a very, very optimistic scenario, scenario but at least we, we would need to make a pessimistic scenario. We would probably come to quite some numbers for copper demand. However, this would result in, this would result in an annual um, growth 
of 5.8% um, for copper demand, and some other scenarios go along with 3.8% of annual uh, growth for copper demand. The average annual growth for the past 50 years is about 3%, 2.9%. So um, these are real quantities for the mining industry to, to tackle with. Wind, the rare earth story, you're all aware about that. High market concentration for uh, rare earth major supplier is China. Then for solar, power the various types of, of cells, thin, cell, thin film cells of amorphous and crystalline silicon, gallium arsenide, and so on. And they um, consume silicon, indium, selenium, cadmium, and gallium, to name a few. And as you see, most of these minor metals, including silicon, that's not a minor metal, but silicon plus minor metals, they all are uh, produced in China, mainly produced in China. So when you pop around in literature and, and try to, to collect various scenarios, these would be the one for copper, very optimistic. Um, aluminium, also quite, quite a massive increase by global economic growth and renewable energy transition from 53 million to 2026, uh, 92 million tons. Um, and then for the minor metals, that's actually taken from one of our studies, uh, Raw Materials for Future Technologies, um, published in 2016, um, as a subcontract to one of the Fraunhofer Institutes. And they come up with numbers, okay, not, not really big numbers for the minor metals. So that's probably not, not the problem, but when you look at some of the rare earth, uh, some significant amounts uh, that will come to 2035, and possibly vanadium, current production 83,000 uh, tons, uh, future additional production consumption needed 32,000 tons of vanadium. So, um, and lithium, not considering EV, uh, electromobility for stationary energy storage, maybe some additional 5,000 tons, which is, which is almost nothing. The scenarios for the e-mobility, I'll come to that uh, just now. E-mobility. So I want to cut the story short for e-mobility because I, I think there's another talk uh, focusing on it. But certainly with uh, our task to advise German industry, um, there is big demand in advising the automotive uh, sector at the moment. So we've done a very detailed uh, lithium uh, risk analysis um, and study, and our colleagues are right now in Australia visiting the mines and running around in Chile and Argentine to visit the projects there. They're coming up, trying to get a, a better picture of what's really going on on the ground. But for the Lithium mine production, um, you have a high market concentration, although um, lithium is mainly produced in Australia, Chile, and Argentine, which have a, actually a low country risk or a lower country risk. They are market-oriented, not like China sometimes. Cobalt, a necessary major producer, over 60% coming from the DRC with all these problems involved with child labor and so on. There's just recently been the, uh, published the Amnesty International report on cobalt production in the DRC, uh, which takes the matter quite serious. And, um, and vanadium, vanadium, major producer, China, has, um, and, and South Africa and Russia. So th there's currently quite quite a run on vanadium. There are a couple of takeovers in South Africa and so on. It's quite strategic. So this is the sort of criticality matrix which you know from the EU. We have uh, more simplified criticality analysis just looking at the market concentration by the Hoffendahl-Hirschmann index and the weight country risk using the World Bank 
uh, risk indicators, country risk indicators, and you come up with this chart where you see uh, that actually cobalt and lithium plus vanadium and graphite, they are lying in the field of a high market concentration. Anything above this 2,500 value is high market concentration. But for lithium, you have a lower country risk because of these market-oriented um, countries. And for copper, aluminium, and some others, they are somewhere here right in the middle, pretty relaxed uh, market concentration, also for nickel. So also in our studies and advisory, we currently focus on, on lithium, cobalt, graphite, and, and also vanadium. So within this lithium um, risk analysis, we came up with three demand scenarios, actually based on, on various published scenarios on technology roadmaps, talking with uh, German automotive industry, and so on. We came up with a demand scenario from starting from 7.3% annual uh, growth in consumption till 2025, up to 12.8% of consumption. This is lithium carbonate divided by five. You come to a total, a maximum total demand of about 110,000 tons of lithium content. And the mining industry has, has a challenge to, to meet this demand and we have done two supply scenarios, one which is scenario two, we think is, is, an, is an optimistic scenario because we think that all the, the projects that are scheduled for 2025, including start of production in Bolivia, which is a bit difficult, but still including some, um, some production in Bolivia and, and, and optimistic capacity extensions and exploration results, we come up with a total plant capacity of more than 150,000 tons of lithium content, but because everybody knows projects are not coming on stream um, in, in, in to a full extent, we subtract 30% and we come to an expected, our expected capacity would be around 110,000 tons of lithium um, that would be available in 2025. And even if you take the most optimistic scenario of demand growth of 12.8% of growth in demand for lithium contained, um, we expect the market will be in balance. That's a key, actually a key message. But we have only one scenario um, where the market could run into deficit in 2025. And that would be the case um, if it would be the worst case if many projects do not realize as scheduled. So uh, there could be a deficit of 22,000 tons of lithium, which uh, is quite a lot. But we say this would be a preliminary deficit because there's a hell of a lot of investment into the lithium market. And if projects are not performing that well, they will come in future if demand will actually follow this 12.8% route or maybe if there's only 9% growth in annual demand, um, then we expect sufficient capacity, lithium capacity on the market. And that's a, it's a positive sig signal, although you have to keep your eyes open, watch the market every year, monitor the market, and see how the projects are going to realize. Well, finally, Remember where we came from. Industrialization started in the UK with the coal era, with the coal, coal era, followed by Germany on the verge to the 20th century. 
and the United States were fully growing within the fossil fuel era with oil, gas, coal, but also atomic energy. And we now, at the beginning of the 21st century, talk about the renewable energy and digital um, era, which consumes a different set of mineral raw materials, as just discussed. And when you look at the market concentration for the oil sector, even if you put the, the 12 OPEC countries in one basket, treat them as one behaving like one country, the market concentration for oil is still moderate. It's in the medium range. So there are many other suppliers in the world producing oil. But when you look at raw materials for the renewable energy transition, like for silicium, lithium, rare earth, cobalt, indium, and so forth, the market concentration is much, much higher. You have only a few, two or three um, suppliers for these commodities. And for some, China is the dominant producer. And as industrialization happened through time in different periods using different raw materials, actually China uses the chance of growing within the renewable energy <coughs> era. And maybe that they will determine um, this century. And we are very keen to see what's happening in India. And most probably, if they renew their infrastructure and grow um, their, their economy, they will probably also use more renewable energy, as this probably is the new um, fuel in future. Although fossil fuels will be needed towards um, far into the 21st century, that is for sure, for sure, because it takes a lot of time for the renewable energy era to grow and to have a major share. So with these words, I thank you for your attention, and I would like to still raise the question, if we do see these changes, do we run in new, into new conflicts with the raw materials sector. Do we run, and maybe we should not make the same mistakes we did with the fossil fuel era, repeating these mistakes with all the conflicts attached with the renewable energy and digital era. Thanks. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions, and as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have these discussion ses sessions. So in terms of um, having lots of ideas, to pick, so lots of time to pick up some of these big ideas, we'll have lots of time later. So, but if you've got questions now, particularly on Peter's talk, then uh, we do have a few minutes for that. Yes, question here. Uh, hi, it's Richard from Dominica. Um, thank you, Peter. That was a great talk. Uh, just a general question, really. I mean, we, we clearly have a supply constraint coming up in the future especially for countries like Germany, who are very um, material dependent for their, for their economy. Um, what you are advising the, the federal government in Germany about um, potential policy changes, what sort of changes are you advising the, the government in Germany? Are you advising to maybe increase or promote um, uh, extraction in, in Germany or in Europe, or are you advising the government to sort of or, or establish ties with, with foreign countries to um, increase the extraction routes abroad? Our main task is, well, certainly we advise the government, but our main task is to advise the German industry because, and that's the government's position, it's in their responsibility to secure raw materials, secure the supply chain, um, for, for, for these raw materials. So there are government programs. We had actually an exploration support program uh, revised. Uh, a second, um, second, a second. there was an exploration support program in the, in the 70s 
that ran quite successfully with Degussa and Prysarg and all these mining companies that were still around in those days. So we re reactivated that program in 2013. It ran three years. We had only a very, very few applications, right? Also for mining in Germany and overseas it was specified to German companies. But then finally, um, the financial authorities looked at it and they said, um, well, for these few applications, it's not worth it. And they closed it down. It was very sad. So that was, um, and, and the, the government wanted to initiate to revive mining in Germany and overseas. That failed. Um, so the manufacturing industry does not go back into mining. And it's very valid for them to say this is not our core business. So they have to secure the supply chain. There's another government instrument called the Guarantees for Untied Loan Systems. This is an instrument to support offtake agreements uh, for German companies if they want to import oils and concentrates or um, products of the higher value chain. And, um, but then still it's in the responsible to the German companies. And now our job is to advise them, sensitize them for these risks and talk with them about these risks and for various commodities we do these industry workshops with the industry, sit together and, and, and have very intense talks and raise red flags, right? But, I mean, we also look at um, possibilities for diversification, which is, which is one um, major mitigation strategy. So we, we work in various countries together with other geological surveys, write reports about new supply sources, and hope that the industry is taking up some of these ideas. But it's, it's, a, it's a very um, intense process, I'd say. But still, German companies act Maybe we'll see what's happening with the lithium sector. There's a lot of discussion going on there. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, Callum Baker from Anglo-American. Uh, I mean, in the, um, in the situations where raw materials run short, there tends to be a, a price response. And you know, therefore, people start either substituting or, or thrifting or recycling more. To what extent are you factoring in that economic response in, in some of your projections? It is included. Um, for, recycle, for, for substitution, it's very difficult. With the rare earth story, German industry very quickly uh, substituted or made materials more efficient and substituted some of the materials and reduced uh, the intensity of use. So it's difficult. For recycling, it's a bit easier because um, we can only extract recycled material from the economy that was used 20, 30 years ago, copper, aluminium, and stuff like that. So I always say 40 years ago, 50 years ago, we had a global copper consumption of 8 million tons. And um, this is the maximum we can extract today. Today's production is 23 million tons. So there's not enough, sufficient material. So we, we monitor the, the growth in, in uh, recycling material production or what comes back, recycled material, and that normally is not more than 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3% of, of uh, growth in recycled production. Not more, and with that, with these numbers, they will not exponentially increase suddenly. So you just calculate with a smooth, you know, these three percent increase what comes back. So finally, it takes a couple of decades um, to to um, so that recycled material will have a, a higher share in global production. As you are from Anglo, you probably you're certainly aware of the platinum sector, where actually recycling of the catalyzers, cat catalysts, auto catalysts, they impact primary mine production so that PGE mine production is currently stagnating. It's not growing. It's stagna stagnating or even going back. So recycling is very successful in this way. Thank you very much. Uh, 
piece. I think we'd better move on to our next talk, but thank you again for a fantastic opening talk. Uh, and now it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Ryman Bleischwitz, who is Deputy Director of the UCL Institute for Sustainable Resources and holds the VHP Billiton Chair in Sustainable Resources, uh, and who's recently co-authored a book on Want, Waste or War, the Global Resource Nexus and the Struggle for Land, Energy, Food, Water and Minerals. And I think we'll see some of this reflected in your talk. Oh, what do you see? Thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, thanks to Nick and Edmund and Francis for inviting me, and indeed also thanks to Peter for the excellent introductory talk. What I'll be talking about is related to, what well, I would say, two societal challenges, as mentioned by you, and one is the environmental challenges, and the other one would be what I call the challenges of demand. And I will be in particular looking into what we can expect from Chinese demand for the time to come. And the tip, uh, the title here is then called Sustainable Resource Governance, the Nexus and Saturation Levels. So I start with some observations about global trends to just warm you up a bit, where indeed we have seen over the last 10 or 15 years or so a shift in gross dynamics from the OECD countries to the emerging economies and in particular to the Eastern Asian economies. And uh, at the same time, we would expect this growth dynamic to become stabilized, to probably also lead to a south-south growth-driven type of dynamics, which all together then leads into the question of what would we expect in global world economy demand for materials for the next decades or so. And actually, this is a knowledge gap. There are not many of those scenarios around. Many of them are more like technology specific and they all have their sort of uncertainties. But when you look into say the energy area where the International Energy Agency has been around for decades with a mandate to come up with energy scenarios, there's no equivalent yet on the resource side. And indeed this is something that needs to be addressed. One of the very first estimates that have been done under United Nations flag done by the International Resource Panel uh, has come up with an estimate that we can expect a tripling in resource extraction and resource consumption by the year 2050. And the indicator they have chosen is what is called domestic material consumption, which puts together the raw materials, but also including the construction materials, energy sources, and biotic resources. So it's a very aggregated type of indicator, and when they say tripling, this indicates increasing demand, but actually I would like to discuss some of the assumptions here. Um, at the same time, we are probably all fairly supportive to the idea of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the question probably here is, uh, what are the implications for demand for natural resources? We are likely to expect more demand for resources coming from the ambitious goal to secure energy access and sustainable energy access or sustainable energy use as we just heard from Peter. But indeed also when we look at the goals to overcome hunger and uh, to ensure uh, a clean water access for the world's population and a sustainable build up of cities and other infrastructures it is not too difficult to then estimate that it all leads to more demand for mineral fertilizers in the case of food and lots of metals and construction materials for water technologies, but in particular also water infrastructures. And when we speak about cities, yes, we speak about demand for construction materials and metals, etc. So it is not too difficult to say at this point in time that the SDGs, as wonderful as they are, are also likely leading to additional demand. And indeed, there are some cross-cutting ideas, in particular goal number 12, saying that by the year 2030, uh, the uh, resource management uh, to be achieved must be sustainable, whatever that precisely means. So we can take it probably as a pledge to not look at the SDGs in isolation, 
to hopefully not establish new silos where people are concerned about their energy domain, their water domain, their whatever food area, but uh, try to interlink those silos in a meaningful manner and supporting sustainable resource management. This is indeed then where we are looking at new risk that mining industry faces. We are probably less concerned these days, if we ever had been, about the geophysical supply risk. There are more risk coming from the criticality of some materials, from, say, economic conditions, which are, uh, <laughs> I have been mentioned before, the difficulty to access those materials in contractual terms, the uh, volatility of prices, but also what I will um, talk about in the next few minutes is the nexus, the interlinkages, the critical interlinkages of resources of all, say, raw material resources, in particular with water and food, which is the broader environmental angle and the environmental pressures stemming from extraction but also processing materials. So what is this about? The resource nexus idea has come up a couple of years ago. It's been launched by a couple of conferences like the Bonn Conference that was supported also by some German ministries. And I'm now like, like, like uh, editing a handbook on this, which is always good in academic terms. You just do these kind of things with 30-something chapters on it. And it basically means, this resource nexus idea, that we have to become much more aware of the interlinkages between water, energy, food. This is in a way well known. But certainly we will also have to incorporate land and we will have to incorporate materials here for the reason that indeed materials and raw minerals extraction are fairly energy intensive and they are water intensive. And you probably know the numbers and we have seen some of the numbers in regard to energy and materials here. But it's certainly also interesting to realize that many mining activities are not just water intensive, but also take place in, um, in, in mining sites that are under water stress already, and where the likelihood of increased water stress is, is huge, according to climate change impact, or however you call these water stress impact factors. Uh, so the resource nexus idea is fairly interesting also for mining and minerals, in my view. And the way we look at it, and it's illustrated here, is that we have different layers of these activities in those silos. And these layers mean that we have a chain of activities where the extraction is just the beginning. And the energy and water intensity then indeed uh, continues over the processing, the production, and then ultimately the consumption of those material intensive products in a way. And the critical interlinkages, those nexus interlinkages, are indeed relevant at each stage of those activities. So we would not speak of mining as the only water intensive, energy intensive process. We would also need to look at the production of the materials downstream, the production of the products like vehicles, and the use of those vehicles. And for quite some time, environmental policy has been focusing on parts of the chain, mainly the, the territories where the emission happens. <laughs> this is the whole United Nations legislation in a way that we care about the British CO2 emissions, the German CO2 emissions, the Chinese CO2 emissions, as if all the products produced there were consumed there and the other way around. So we have indeed uh, to deal with the logic of international markets where we consume products here that have been produced elsewhere, quite often in China. So these chain of activities, they need to be considered uh, in a holistic manner, looking at the overall, the life cycle white, energy consumption, water consumption of material intensive processes in a way. So that's a sort of interesting angle here I would like to point out. And indeed, we can do this analysis, and some analysis has already started, but since it is like morning time and a great workshop and a great conference here, I thought I could also look at the wider picture. When we look at the countries where mining takes place, we are 
have been introduced to this resource curse debate, say, 20 years ago, and it's been like an ongoing debate, saying basically that countries are not always able to turn natural resource endowments into prosperity for the people due to lack of strong institutions, basically. There is corruption, there are other institutional deficits which in the meantime have been explored. There are some principles available. There's a great work that the Natural Resource Governance <coughs> Institute does. So I would say on the level of analysis, the job is done, more or less. And countries can learn the lessons. The difficulty is indeed to applying them. But when we look at the resource nexus debate, we are very likely facing a situation where food and water stress are hitting uh, fragile countries. And as long as the institutions there are weak, the governance conditions, the civil rights position, human rights, etc., we can expect these countries to come under additional severe stress. And this is also then probably very likely having an impact on economic processes, including mining activities. So what happens if food and water stress hits countries, in particular those countries that are, say, more likely to expect being hit by water stress according to IPCC climate change estimates about the regional occurrence of water stress? What happens if we also looked at the countries which can be classified as weak in terms of governance according to an indicator we have chosen here as a political instability indicator which is close to what the World Bank has done here. And then when we look at the same time at the reserves of minerals as known by say USGS, BGS of course, and other sources. It is no big surprise that we see many African countries here coming up as uh, coming under additional stress, uh, posing more risk on, say, mining operations. And you see more or less the countries coming up here. The DRC is one of them. But all of the total, we probably have like round about 30 countries or so, which can be characterized as water stressed in the future, uh, instable governments or governance conditions, and having significant share in a number of important reserves. And indeed, this piece of work is just a tentative work, and it would need to be specified. You would also think that indeed it needs to be regionally specific, because in large countries like Russia or Indonesia, it is not the state per se, but the region that matters. But the point here is that indeed these nexus interlinkages, and in particular water stress or energy scarcity, are more likely to hit mining companies in the future under the conditions of weak governments, fragile states, and the water stress likely to occur. So with this having said here and spreading the sort of message, I would like to also look into the future in terms of demand. And you may remember that 10 minutes ago, I mentioned the a scenario done by the International Resource Panel that comes up with the estimate of a expected tripling of demand. However, when we look at what has happened in history, and I'm grateful for the graph that Michael Sturmer and others have developed and that you showed us, we also have seen a saturation effect happening. And it is, in a way, intuitively common sense. You build up an infrastructure and you just don't continue decade by decade. So it is in a way normal in history to see that the demand for steel, while well, has a steep increase for a few decades and then starts to saturate. The question is for foresight analysis, have these phenomena been taken into account? And how can we well, come to grips with any such saturation effect? <laughs> Indeed, here comes my simple economic thinking in in saying that markets are always driven by demand. And uh, this has to do with the sovereignty of consumers. We see great advantages of markets of, in responding to demand. So any supplier, any producer knows that ultimately what matters is not the production capacity per se, but what market demands. 
if there is a shift in market demand that consumers fancy other products, or a final good consumer finds a substitute, well, the market demand goes in a different direction. So demand is a quite important category. And the discussion about saturation actually, well, happened in the 80s of last century, so some of us may remember. There was also in the 90s of last century a debate which was labeled as environmental cousinous curve, and it had like an angle on the material side, basically meaning and referring to the economist Simon Kuznets, that, well, this, uh, here's the anecdote, that Simon Kuznets discovered that income inequality over the decades of development usually had been increasing in the beginning, and then the income equality became less severe. So there was more income equality over time. So he did this analysis in the 50s of last century, and right now we have quite a new debate whether, in fact, we are entering a new stage of capitalism where inequality rises again. But the point taken there is that you have this inverted U-curve of problems rising at the beginning and then becoming more relaxed that was translated and applied to a number of environmental pollutants. So the point here was that, indeed, there were attempts to discuss a saturation an environmental Kuznets curve for materials. But this debate at that time stagnated. There was a lack in data. So it was high time to rejuvenate this debate. And indeed, the implication for China would uh, very much be that, as we have seen China growing over the last 20 years with an incredibly strong appetite for uh, natural resources, are we expecting China to have these growth rates in demand for natural resources in the future too? Two-digit rates per year or not? So with a saturation effect, we would expect that China actually has a much flatter demand for natural resources in the future. So we did some calculation, and I hope the figures are more or less readable. We applied an indicator called apparent domestic consumption which indeed takes into account the imports, not just of raw materials, but also the imports of goods that embed natural resources as a component, like vehicles, for instance. And indeed, you need to do this, because it's just our today's reality that we import so many material-intensive goods. So we did this exercise for steel, cement, aluminum, copper for five countries, basically. US, UK, Germany, Japan, and for China. And what you see, uh, oh, I should also say that uh, what we have done is not to look for the years per se, because as we just heard, the development occurred over different stages in different countries. And UK was first, and then Germany, US, and Japan was much later doing its development. So it's hard to just look at the years, it's better, I think, what we did here, in that we looked at income per capita, independent on when actually it has happened. And what you see here for steel in particular, for the apparent domestic consumption for steel, that actually, after a couple of decades, there has been this more stable demand trend in the use of steel. You also see it for cement. You see it somehow more uncertain, yet in a way also evident for aluminium and also for copper. With quite different pathways, you also see the decoupling starting at different income levels, so a bit earlier for steel and cement and a bit later, say $20,000 per capita for aluminium and copper, because these materials are used also for many consumer products where you need an average higher consumption level to purchase those consumer goods. But nevertheless, the overall story is that this saturation effect is relevant. It is evident throughout history for those five materials for the four industrialized countries. And it's also interesting to see where China is right now, because it is more or less at the peak in some of the materials. It is even exacerbating. It is way above uh, any 
uh, number that we've seen in the case of cement. So it's easy to say that China is probably the most cement intensive economy in the world. But indeed then, the question would be, what can we expect for China to happen with the demand for natural resources and materials for the next few years? And here's the sort of uh, different pathways one could do. So we could think of a extrapolation type of exercise where we correlated the development of the last 20 years and then extrapolated it into the future in a somehow flattening type of curve. But nevertheless, all these dots represent certain steel consumption data of, uh, for the other industrialized countries. We could also very well imagine that the steel consumption actually decreases. And then the question probably is, whether the Chinese economy follows more the steel patterns of UK and the US or Japan, which has been much more steel intensive. So in all likelihood, you would think that China will probably more look into the Japanese patterns for a number of reasons. But nevertheless, we would not expect the Chinese steel consumption to increase any further, which then indeed has a number of implications also for uh, uh, well, for other materials that are like, like, like also used in the steel production. And you may or not be surprised here, so this is more like an economic exercise. Indeed, when we look at the current five years plan in China, they already have started to cut the production in, in steel. So the, uh, this sort of analysis has also been done in a way in China itself. <laughs> Nevertheless, it would also need to be translated into those scenarios, into those macroeconomic models, etc. So we have started to establish a, a macroeconomic uh, model here, which is a CGE type of model. We have taken into account a number of uh, raw material data here. We have a number of world regions. We have done an exercise on steel, which has been published. And uh, indeed, this leads into a sort of a perspective, an outlook. Is there a perspective of greening the mining companies? I would say yes, very much so. There is the idea of a nexus innovation push, that mining companies could become pioneers in applying renewable energy themselves. Uh, they could also probably do much better on the water side, like the desalination project that has started in, in Chile. There is also a clear regulatory pull in seeing while well, policymakers uh, phasing out year by year the fossil fuels, in particular coal, so we would expect all the portfolio mining companies to uh, well, push back on coal, while at the same time they'll probably shift towards the higher production rate for uh, raw materials, in particular those that are relevant for the SDGs. We would also expect a stronger global collaboration uh, on assessments, on the question on what would be suitable mining sites under the conditions of political instability, water stress, etc. Uh, uh, may also see stronger uh, efforts to integrate value chains like refineries or even parts of recycling. When I look at, say, Boliden, a Scandinavian mining company, which is actually quite active on the recycling side. So here's my outlook. I would state that sustained resource governance is challenged by different angles. There are expectations on increasing re demand, which come from also like some of the environmental agreements. There are also, on the other hand, uh, nexus challenges, which are in particular relevant in the water area and the energy. And there's also a likelihood of saturation levels that are, uh, can be expected for China, but also sooner or later for other emerging economies, that if we look into, say, 2030, 2050, need to be taken into account. So after all, on my side, this is a pledge for a collaboration between geology and open arms, I would say, from the side of economists. So we might be coining a new discipline here, which we may call geolonomics, where the two sides come together, not just on the supply side, but also in particular on the demand side of understanding the market pattern. Thanks a lot. I wish to thank you for your attention. very much, Raymond. Um, time for one quick question, if someone has one. Yes, Richard. Hi, Richard Harrington from the Natural History Museum. Uh, very interesting to talk about the saturation, but you, 
did mention it in your summing up there that there are other emerging economies. I mean, there's, there's India, and then there's the mint countries, if you ever believe they're going to come up. So are we going to see a series of saturation humps? I mean, India I mean, could be as big as, as China as a, as, a, as a demand. So we're pushing that saturation, presumably, to beyond when China saturates, because someone else will be filling that gap. What's your view on that? Well, absolutely. I mean, when we look at, say, today's uh, consumption levels in India, they are way below China. So we would expect the saturation level to be reached in India like in 10, 15, 20 years eventually. It's also indeed that we have to look at what happens actually in China. So history is, is just one source of information for future estimates. And the One Belt, One Road initiative, for instance, is likely to lead to increased demand for couple of resources, new infrastructure products coming up, but also Chinese companies trying to locate to some of the Asian economies, which is one way of how they deal with the structural change that is likely to be necessary for steel and cement production in particular. So we can expect some relocation effects to happen, and indeed over the years. Uh, it is not that I was suggesting here that we are uh, reaching a saturation level for all emerging economies, but as you say, there is a wave of those saturation effects that we might be reaching over the next, say, few decades for countries like some of uh, India, but also some of the African economies, if they ever take off. And just a little subsidiary on that, I mean, a number of very mature economies like the US, Canada, for example, yeah. their infrastructure is in really poor shape. Yes. Uh, well, certainly we need to incorporate replenishment or maintenance, refurbishment of infrastructures. We have like huge deficits in water infrastructure and in all industrialized countries. We would also look at the uh, shape of the roads, the railway infrastructure. So certainly there is a need for investments here, which is likely to mean, well, replenishment efforts. Uh, when we looked at the infrastructure development, we have also s done some analysis on stocks. We have seen over the last decades also a uh, demand for resources coming from replenishment needs. So in a way, I would believe that from the uh, side of, say, research, it can be incorporated. And when we look at, say, future business as usual scenarios, they would need to become more sophisticated in a way to incorporate saturation, but also infrastructure replenishment needs. So it might also be that we have to develop a couple of business as usual scenario rather than one <coughs> simple, which is often all too stupid type of uh, business as usual case, if I may say so. Right, thank you very much. I think we better leave that there. Thank you very much again for your talk. Thank you. In our final talk before the, the coffee break, it's a great pleasure now to introduce David Manning, Professor of, Professor of Soil Science at Newcastle University and the past president, of course, of the Geological Society. Uh, well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organisers for giving me the opportunity to speak here, and I'd certainly like to thank the previous two speakers, because I think these three talks go well together. I hope you agree by the time I've finished. You see there my job title is Professor of Soil Science. I'm a geologist. I work at the interface between minerals and the biosphere. And as in the context of what we're talking about today, what I'm particularly interested in is the interface between human life on the planet and the raw materials that we, we mine. And with that in mind, I want to jump straight in to think about how we use mineral raw materials. So I'm taking here from the Global Material Flows database the population statistics on the um, bottom axis here, the x-axis, and the amount of resources extracted. We've seen graphs like this before this morning. But we can see, as we know, ores, metal ores, have been rising between 1980 and 2013 in this data. But the key thing that uh, concerns me is how industrial minerals, which include construction materials, have risen rather faster. What's interesting is in the graph on the right, where these are uh, expressed as the proportion of extracted resources. And that extracted resources includes biomass and, and, and all the other resources that we use in uh, humanity at the present day. 
we can see that the extraction of metals proportionately has basically stayed much the same. It's around 12% of the resources extracted within plus or minus 2%. Whereas we can see that the industrial and construction materials have risen from about 20% of the total to 35% of the total. And of course, we can't just put that down simply to construction, which of course is a major part of it, because of course steel, which is an important part of modern construction, would be figuring in here. Uh, so there are some, there's something underneath this that we need to drill down into to explore, to understand how society uses industrial minerals. The key thing, of course, is not only is population growing, but people are changing. So people are moving from uh, living in uh, relatively small uh, towns in, in rural habitats or whatever uh, to mega cities. And the key thing about that is that there are several basic human rights. We all want somewhere to live. We need enough to eat and drink. We are becoming more prosperous as time goes on, and then that allows us to exercise our fundamental human right to go out and buy something. And you just need to visit a shopping centre in a country in Southeast Asia just to see how important that is. Uh, we need something to burn. We need energy. These are the things which keep the human race ticking and uh, keep us moving. But that, as we know, as we've heard this morning, comes out of the ground. I like to think that our supermarkets are amongst the biggest mining companies on the planet. Every time you go and do your weekly shop, you're mining, you're taking something. Because all of the consumer goods you buy in a supermarket have, come, have had some connection with mining. We get more prosperous as time goes on, we buy more things. There is growth in the economy. Uh, it varies, of course, from one country to another. And I hasten to say I'm not an economist, so I hope those of you who are will forgive me. But as we move forward, we see policy objectives creating demand for new min minerals, and we need to be careful in the context of the fact that we only live in one planet, let alone living in just one island, as we do in the United Kingdom. We need to make sure that we have enough mineral raw materials to allow society to grow. The key thing that concerns me is the scale of what is required, and that's what I want to spend time talking about. We know that population growth is rising. It's probably easier to predict future population growth than it is to predict future climate change. But we know that population growth is rising, and we can predict that to, uh, with some degrees of confidence. And we have, as we have heard, policy decisions that have come along that impose enormous challenges to us. So I want to have a quick look at, the, at that, but spend more time on the population growth side of things. As an illustrator of that, I'm going to go to fertilizers, fertilizer minerals, which Raymond introduced. There is, as we all know, the basic need to eat, the basic need to feed people. I want to focus on potash, because potash, I think, is the one that certainly is the mineral which keeps me awake at night. And I'm going to set some homework. If you want to do some homework on potash, we had a workshop here in June, an international workshop on alternative potash. If you simply Google IWAP, then you'll find that, and there's some excellent talks in there that are available for anyone to, to read uh, quite freely. So where do we go to with this? It's very, very interesting to look at the figures published by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. They, they don't see any problem with fertilizer minerals. But when you look at the figures which they produce, you can see some very interesting points. This shows the consumption or demand that they publish in terms of kilograms per head. I've, I've taken it to, to per head basis by using the population statistics for the regions which they subdivide it into. I have to be ever so careful doing that because they don't use the same regions as the United Nations. So you have to see through that. But you can see three clusters here. You can see that the world, this funny triangle thing, uh, runs along here. This is sort of the global average consumption or demand of potash per head. And there's a cluster of regions which are in that realm of about four to six kilograms of potash per head. And those are, Europe's in there, both uh, Western and Central Europe. Uh, but we then see that we have some regions which consume well above that global average. And as you might imagine, North America is top of the list and South America, which is perhaps a bit more of a surprise, comes second. The areas of great concern are these down here. Africa bumps along the bottom, consuming less than one kilo of potash per head from the world's supply of potash. We have West Asia here, which is intriguing as well. That includes Iran, that area. And then South Asia, which is India and parts of Southeast Asia. So it is uh, an interesting set of figures which we can drill down into and have a close look at. This graph shows percentage of use against percentage of population. So the one-to-one -one line 
is where there's a balance between the proportion of use of the commodity of potash for the population. So pro rata, people are taking their share. And again, we've got North America and South America well above that line. But what is worrying is when we look at what's below the line, and particularly Africa. Here we've got Africa with 15% of the world's population or more, taking about uh, 3 to 4% of the world's production of potash. Africa's population will double by 20, 2050, from 1 billion to 2 billion. Those people are all going to want to eat something. Where are they going to get it from? Either Africa's soils are remarkably fertile, or they're not. And it seems to be quite clear that Africa stands out like a sore thumb as being in need of more potash. And we can consider this in terms of uh, the potash glut and the potash gap. We can see here global production of potash. We, we might suppose that uh, those which uh, lie above this, which is with, where the K2O balance, the balance expressed using FAO figures as the amount of potash available as fertilizer minus that that is consumed in these regions, uh, well above the, uh, the, the global average uh, for uh, North America, but also for Central Europe. And this is, of course, because of the production of potash in Central Europe. Whereas the rest of the world is below the line, uh, below the average for the world, of course, and uh, we can see the amount of production. They tend to be a number of minor producers of potash compared with the dominance of North America and, and uh, Central Europe and Belarus in, in the north and top part of the graph. But, of course, the line which is interesting is the zero, the deficit, the potash deficit is below that line. Funnily enough, Africa appears not to be in deficit, and that's a, a, an anomaly of the FAO figures. So, looking back at that first graph, if we want to bring everyone up to the average, and of course it's like raising educational standards in schools, you bring everyone up to the average and the average moves up, so we go around and do it again. But to bring these countries up, we need to mine an extra 10 to 11 million tonnes of potash per year to enable people in Africa, South Asia and West Asia to have the same amount of potash in their food, to have healthy food, in other words. But if you look at the agronomics of this and talk to people who look at potash offtake in crops, the world needs to double potash production at the present day to feed the current world population. And that clearly is something which isn't happening. So we're mining our soils and to solve that problem, because that's clearly unsustainable, we have to see potash production rising. Moving on, I want to have a quick look at policy drivers. And there are two I want to look at here. Removal of carbon dioxide from flue gas emissions and the decision in this country to move away from petrol or diesel vehicles after 2040. Starting with flue gas emissions, we know from work done by our research councils and our universities that there's some very clever chemistry that can remove carbon dioxide from flue gases. And the engineers look at pilot plant scale-up, that sort of level of scale-up, but what actually is required? Looking at figures from the Bayes, the, uh, the government department uh, that projects these matters, uh, UK power stations currently expect to generate 81 million tonnes of CO2 per year, and that's to drop to 46 by 2035. So there's 35 million tonnes of CO2. Let's just take that figure and see what the implications are for minerals. And if we take a silica-based material to scrub CO2 out of flue gases. So there's some work in Sheffield which shows very nicely that you can use these. If, so if we, let's, let's just suppose we want to take a million tonnes of carbon dioxide from a gas stream at a power station using a silica-based product. Well, that is a product. 25 million tonnes of it will be needed to take 1 million tonnes out of the atmosphere. Where does that come from? It comes from sodium silicate. Sodium silicate is made from silica sand, but sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is made from halite, from sodium chloride. We can backtrack from the stoichiometry of these reactions to say, yes, we need 25 million tonnes of silica sand, but we also need 48 million tonnes of halite for that. And in the UK, we only mine 4 million tonnes or thereabouts of silica sand per year. We only mine 6 million tonnes of sodium chloride per year. So we only mine 16% of what's needed to take a million tonnes of CO2 out, or 12% of the halite needed to make uh, the product that takes that uh, CO2 out of the atmosphere. And if we want to take 35 million tonnes out by 2035, the amount of mining of sand in this country would have to go up by 220 times. It's never going to happen. And similarly, if we're going to do the same thing and look at the halite production, that would have to go up by a factor of 280 times. Well, these are enormous figures. These demonstrate the scale of what is required. And I don't think that has been widely appreciated. And I do know that it isn't as simple as that. Reuse, as we know, would be vitally important. So 
Well, if we look briefly at lithium, and then I was billed by Nick as talking about lithium, it's only a one slider, basically. Uh, the, the key point about lithium, of course, is that, we, again, we can do a similar sum. So we've heard about this in the previous two talks. But again, if we're to achieve the global target of what we might need in lithium, we need 40 years' worth of production of lithium to achieve the, 30, the target that we have to reach 13 years from now. And again, this is, this is something which is really, really rather challenging. So how do we get to where we want to? And this is where we think about the shape of what the minerals industry might look like. Um, we have to have more mining of industrial minerals. That message came out from Raymond's talk very clearly. And we obviously have to have more resource recovery and reuse. But the circular economy, as we heard from Peter, needs to be primed. And we're working with a lag time of 30 years on that. Well, the key risk to any supply of minerals is actually public consent, isn't it? Here we have an example in Yorkshire. We, I have no connection with Sirius Minerals, but we have an example of a mine that is being planned to be invisible. A mine with minimal impact and with public consent. Just 30 miles away, a major industrial project is being hampered by daily demonstrations from those who want to oppose fracking. And they've got it wrong. Sirius Minerals have got it right. Sirius Minerals has got public consent and has won permission the first permission for planning permission of this type uh, for a mine in a national park in this country. So they've done it right. It'll be an invisible mine. Its production capacity, when it's completed, will be 10 million tonnes of potash annually. That's a third of global production. That's a remarkable development in this country. It's going to be as important to the world as the Canadian potash deposits. Perhaps. We shall see how it works out. But they are in the process of sinking shafts at the moment. It is going ahead. So that's probably what we'll see in the future. And the key to enabling this to happen is public consent. And that's the key challenge for us as people interested in mining, is how can we enable people to accept that mining doesn't need to be a bad neighbour? How can we enable people to connect their everyday shopping with the Need with the fact that mining is what supplied what they buy. So we'll see this moving on. We need a step change in the way in which public consent is considered, and we need to follow Sirius Minerals' example in making sure that works well. And other companies, I hasten to say, there are quite a few near us in Newcastle that do very well. And I'd like to see mining companies occupy a similar niche in society to supermarkets. We know supermarkets do good things, we know they do bad things, but supermarkets are everyday parts of society. They are the tip of the iceberg of mining. And remember, every supply chain starts with a mine. So the take-home message is to think of this graph once more and to consider the fact that industrial minerals are going to be growing faster than metals as a pro, pro rata uh, of the raw materials that are extracted. And to think that we are at the, we, we're dependent on minerals at the beginning of everything, we buy appreciated to convert it there. But the bottom line here is how do we manage the demand in the context of public consent? How can we do more to enable uh, the consent that is required for mining to go ahead in any country in the world to be properly managed? With that, I'd like to thank you, and I'd like to remind you of the Resourcing Future Generations uh, meeting that's coming up next year, where there'll be a session on this. If anyone is interested in putting an abstract in, there's still plenty of time. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Marsh, David. That's, uh, as you say, I think those three talks um, have really set the scene. Um, any questions for David? Well, if you visit a landlocked country in Africa, you soon find out that um, the global potash market might just as well be on the moon. It's simply inaccessible, and it's inaccessible for several reasons. Uh, logistics is actually a key one. If you've got the money, actually, it's extremely difficult to get hold of potash. 
but the price is also a major issue. I don't have any objection to there being a, a price of potash in the ways, uh, at the level it is now, because you need to have a return on the investment that's gone into the mining, and of course that has to be done to, to, in a way that satisfies the investors. So I don't have a problem with that, but what I do have is a problem with the way in which um, that is inaccessible to the everyday small farmer in a poor country. So we've been doing a lot of work in Brazil, and of course Brazil figures on that, that map. And in, in Brazil, they, they import 4 million tonnes of potash a year or more. They were paying $1,000 a tonne not so long ago, and it costs $150 a tonne to take it from Santos to the Cerrado, agricultural reasons, regions. Uh, the Brazilians have um, long said that if they invented fertilisers instead of Rothamsted, blaming us, of course, then we wouldn't be putting chemical fertilisers on the ground, we'd be putting silicate minerals. For tropical soils, silicate minerals work and they don't work up here in the north, and, and that's why we use chemical fertilizers. But in the, in the tropical regions, they do. So Brazil has um, now changed federal law to allow uh, potash uh, to be applied as potassium silicates, as, as felspar, basically. And that's a recent change, which means that the dynamics will change and make it more accessible for local materials to be used. That is a, an approach which we need to take to Africa. Um, so it's a great pleasure now to introduce David Merriman, who is Deputy Division Manager for Mine and Metals at Roskill. Um, and David's uh, background is in geology, and before joining Roskill, he worked as an exploration geologist um, on precious metal and rare earth element projects in South America and Africa. Over to you, David. So yes, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for, for asking us to come along and speak at the event. Well, this, um, the presentation is um, it's quite a broad subject title really, uh, going to be a bit more focused uh, on uh, one technology in particular, but the idea is to give, uh, give an overview really of the diversification of raw materials which are going to be required uh, during these technology um, advancements and, and looking a bit for, uh, forward into the future as well. Oops. Um, so just a quick note, uh, this presentation does include some forward-looking statements, so a quick disclaimer. So yes, um, the kind of evolution of raw materials, uh, which Peter kind of touched on in his uh, presenta presentation earlier, has really been... Um, an ongoing feature throughout the ages, uh, going back to the kind of early use of building stones into early uh, metallurgical work, uh, the Industrial Revolution, but really uh, has ramped up exponentially over the past 100 to 150 years or so. Uh, with, in the early 1900s, really the advent of mass production of uh, automobiles or materials such as uh, nickel, tungsten being used in steel alloys, uh, the use of rubber, petroleum, obviously a massive uh, industry which has been affected by automobiles as well, uh, which um, has really created um, the next step into expanding these raw material usage. As you go into the late 1900s, uh, utility uh, machinery, washing machines, tumble dryers saw increasing use in stainless steels, in aluminium, and also the start of electronic materials which are being used, these silicon gold, um, these kind of materials as well. But the latest steps really have been in the, in the past 20 to 30 years or so with the explosion of electronic materials. Uh, and particularly here, this, uh, the picture of a, of a wind turbine uh, into energy generation as well. So we've seen a whole list of materials starting to be used in these widely manufactured products. And now we appear to be on the precipice of another um, kind of shift in material usage with the advent of electric vehicles, which is going to create a whole new uh, range of, um, of demand growth for a lot of these raw materials from lithium, cobalt, graphite, and nickel, which will really be the main focus of this presentation. So this chart here uh, shows the cumulative increase in wind power capacity. Um, just to give an idea of the growth that's been experienced over the past um, 10 years or so. So there's been uh, probably a kind of a five times increase since 2007 in, 
in the gigawatts of, of power that have been produced. And if we kind of move this forward into our forecast, you can see that this um, increase is expected to continue over the next 10-year period quite strongly, driven by generation in Asia and in Europe in particular. Now, this is going to create this, a continuation of the demand for these raw materials, particularly in steel products, in the uh, motor materials and generators that are going to be used in there. But, and sorry, an increase of 150% uh, over that period. But this, uh, the raw material usage um, essentially is going to have to increase quite strongly. Now, if we look at this for electric vehicles, and this is a graph really of forecast electric vehicle sales out to 2030. Well, we expect to see a similar uh, pattern approaching uh, or uh, forecast over this next 13 year period. And this is really going to be the next big shock into uh, raw material demand, uh, and particularly into markets which aren't quite so suited to scale up in the volumes that are required. So, yes, this growth over a 13 period of just, uh, just shy of 1,000% in unit sales. So what products are actually required in electric vehicles? Well, I'll talk about lithium-ion batteries and electric motors in more detail during this presentation, but it kind of is important to also remember that it's not just these components that make an electric vehicle. The chassis of a lot of these electric vehicles need a lot of weight-saving uh, alloys used, so a lot more aluminium, magnesium alloys, plastics, and carbon fiber materials are going to be required in the production of these, um, of these cars. Uh, the LED displays, if, uh, if I'm not sure if any of you have been in a lot of the new electric vehicle models, but they generally have a very large uh, touchscreen or LED display at the front, and this is going to create a lot more demand for things like rare earths, gallium, precious metals, and, and the electronics that you use there, uh, and also the electronics which link up the different components of the car uh, are going to require a lot more copper. Uh, and a lot more silicon, tantalum, precious metals in the circuitry and computing in these cars as well. But the two main focuses really have been on the lithium-ion battery, which requires a whole suite of materials, and also the electric motor. So this chart here is taken from a UBS presentation, and it just shows the, the kind of impact that uh, this demand growth is expected to have on certain uh, commodity markets or materials markets. So obviously lithium and cobalt at the top there, which have had a lot of attention recently, uh, and we'll talk on them in a bit more detail later. But also it's important to see that this shift towards electric vehicles is not particularly positive for all markets. There will be some losers in these industries. So things like the use of steel in, uh, or heavy, heavier steels in um, in the chassis and, uh, and the, the construction of these, uh, these cars is expected to decline. The use of uh, PGMs is expected to drop off as well, particularly from their use in catalytic converters. And also, if you look at materials such as tungsten, which is used in uh, a lot of the wear uh, or grinding parts for in the manufacture of um, kind of engine blocks and, and steel products for automotives, the lack of the reducing use of, of them will also impact demand for these kind of markets. So it's, um, it is going to create both positive and negative changes in raw material usage. So if we really look at the lithium market first, and lithium has really led the interest in electric vehicle uh, raw material growth, really. And demand is expected to increase very significantly. Over the next, by 2026, we see demand for lithium increasing by between four to 500 uh, percent, which is creating about 750,000 tons of uh, LCE, which is lithium carbonate equivalent, in additional production required to meet this demand growth. Now, electric vehicles or uh, lithium-ion batteries, I should really say, at the present day, um, create around 50 percent of lithium demand. Now, this is expected to increase to about 90% of, uh, of lithium demand over the next 9 to 10 years. So the real kind of dynamics of the materials which are going to be required in the lithium industry um, are going to have to change with that. And the real big question is, can the lithium industry scale up to meet this demand? 
Well, if you look at the, um, the, the added capacity which is going to be required, uh, currently there is around 300,000 tonnes of LCE uh, capacity in the world for lithium production. And this, uh, to meet the demand growth by 2026, we're going to probably need about 1.2 million tonnes of lithium carbonate equivalent production. Uh, this is taking into account the capacity utilisation of a lot of these um, plants and also the loss of material down the, um, during the production of these batch of grade materials which are going to be required. Now, this chart here shows the existing producers at the bottom and then additional new brine and mineral projects that are expected that are um, in the pipeline, should you say, that have reported uh, a capacity to come online by 2021. So if you look at the phase one capacity, um, that is the initial startup capacity, you can see that we're getting near to that 1.2 million tonnes of LCE capacity. Uh, and then with the phase two capacity, second expansions or kind of uh, changes in the materials that are being, uh, being produced, we're exceeding that 1.2 million tonnes. Um, so on the face value of this, it all seems that capacity is going to be able to meet demand. But that's not really the true picture. A lot of this uh, capacity which is in the pipeline is not actually expected to reach production. If we look at historical uh, announcements by companies, and these are major lithium producers which are experienced producers and have a lot of capacity to, or, or capital to expand this capacity, around a third of that, um, sorry, the chart on the, on the right here, you have capacity in 2011, and then at that stage, the capacity uh, expansions that were forecast for last year. And if you look at the changes between that forecast capacity and the actual capacity that was, that was realised, you're seeing about a third of that capacity was never actually realised. So if you apply this to the, uh, the 2026 figure that we have here, we are still going to be far short of that 1.2 million tonnes of lithium required. And another thing that we really have to think of is, are we producing the right kind of lithium materials for the battery industry? It's one thing for a very large lithium mineral uh, project to come on uh, or be developed and say we're going to produce 200,000 tonnes of LCE per year. But that is not the material which is required by the battery industry. You need a refined battery grade lithium carbonate or a battery grade lithium hydroxide product. So that is re really where the bottleneck in the industry is forming in that processing capacity. And that is a real big issue for the uh, moving forwards and one that is going to require a lot of investment. So moving on from lithium really, uh, this chart here shows the different cathode material chemistries which are used. At present these uh, NCA uh, and the low nickel NMC materials are those which are widely used in electric vehicles. And you can see that across all of these cathode materials, the lithium content, that's that in the grey bar, remains relatively the same. But the percentage usage, usage of the other materials, particularly for cobalt, nickel and manganese, changes quite widely between these different cathode materials, which is expected to change over the future as different cathode materials are preferred. So cobalt is one of these materials which has really uh, had a lot of attention recently. And, and surprisingly, demand is expected to increase quite strongly. At the moment, we see uh, tot well, total demand for, um, for cobalt is around 100 or just over the 100,000 kilotons of, uh, of cobalt metal mark. And we expect this to, fall, uh, to increase to around 300,000 tonnes by 2026, based off this demand. Now, batteries, which has previously formed about half of this demand, is expected to form a much more significant um, portion of, of demand, and again is going to change the types of raw materials which are required. Now, cobalt is an interesting uh, metal because roughly... Uh, the vast majority of it is produced as a byproduct of either copper or nickel. And uh, a lot of this copper production is based in countries such as the DRC. So it creates a lot of challenges um, for, well, for miners really to develop and, uh, and for end-use uh, consumers to, to meet different um, 
conflict minerals and, uh, and ethical legislation, which is becoming increasingly more important. And also the fact that it's a byproduct of these nickel and cobalt industries, it means that cobalt producers are not able to have that kind of reactivity that a lot of other markets have as their primary product. So really, where will this uh, increase in cobalt production come from? Well, there are a lot of uh, a couple of projects which are expected to come online in the near uh, in the near future. So ERG and Glencore have both got projects in the DRC in Zambia, but as this graph really shows, that will only take us so far. And after 2021, additional sources or where this feedstock will come from is really an unknown. There's a lot of um, possibilities, uh, either further expansions at existing producers, uh, impre improving recoveries, new projects coming online, uh, artisanal supply, tailings um, recovery. Uh, the, list kind of, uh, the list continues, but which one will actually win out at this stage is relatively unknown. Now, moving on to another uh, important part of these cathode chemistries is nickel. Now, batteries uh, currently are very, uh, quite a trivial part of the nickel industry. They account for just under 1% of, uh, of nickel usage, uh, as nickel is dominated by the, stain, uh, by the steel industry, really. And it's one product in particular, nickel sulfate, which is going to be required from, by, uh, in the production of batteries. Um, and Nickel sulfate can be produced from the two main sources of nickel, lateritic and sulfide. But as those are processed into different nickel products down the supply line, it limits the actual material that can be used to produce nickel sulfate. So particularly nickel pig iron and ferronickel are not really cost effective to produce um, nickel sulfate. And these two areas have been the main areas of, of kind of capacity growth for nickel. Uh, so it really could create a bit of a shortage there. Um, the conversion capacity for nickel can be brought online um, as expansions at existing producers, but it really is this um, availability of feedstock which could feed uh, down and create a bit of a, um, a supply shortage for the right kind of materials, particularly if the cathode materials switch towards those higher nickel products which have been increasingly being focused on by EV manufacturers. Now, graphite is also another major part of this. I'm not really an expert on graphite, so I'll be quite quick on this. China is the, uh, is the major producer of uh, both synthetic and natural graphite. There's two types of graphite which feed into, into the anodes. So graphite forms about 95% of anode material. And the, the whole graphite market is really focused around the Chinese market. Now, there is a lot of spare capacity for graphite in China, so there isn't really expected to be um, that much of a supply shortage, particularly with very large graphite projects expected to come online and this excess of processing capacity in China. So graphite uh, is not really an issue as well. So moving away really from batteries and onto electric motors, is this really the next big shift in the raw materials required by electric vehicles? Well, there's two real types of motors which are targeted. There's um, induction motors, which typically use a lot of copper, and uh, permanent magnet motors, which is the real focus here, um, particularly for their usage of, raw, of uh, rare earth uh, elements. So why use a permanent magnet motor? Well, it has a lot of advantages despite its generally higher cost. It has a, a greater torque density. The current that's required um, from the battery to power it is, uh, is lower. It's lower weight. It's smaller. And its efficiency uh, particularly matched uh, when looking at the driving styles of a standard user is very good compared to copper um, rotor induction motors. <coughs> Now, the increasing use of, electric, uh, of permanent magnet motors in electric vehicles, we've seen a lot of new electric vehicle models uh, incorporating these uh, technologies into their new designs. Uh, Tesla is the latest one, really, to shift across with its longer range uh, Model 3 uh, models. Um, and this, even with kind of small or medium kind of market penetration rates for 
uh, for the use of these permanent magnet motors into EVs, we're going to see a huge strain put on the rare earth industry, which just doesn't have the projects and a lot of the process and capacity required to output these volumes of the, of the right materials which are required. So if we look at the rare earth industry as a whole, there's generally a massive oversupply of material when you look at all the materials together. You've got to remember that the rare earth is a suite of 14 different materials. So it's, um, if you look at it at this top level, it looks like everything is, uh, is okay and there will be enough material. But it, you really have to break this down on an element by element scale to get the true picture. So if we look here, here is um, rare earth supply on the left. Um, which shows how um, the breakdown of materials uh, which are mined is, is split. So for permanent magnet materials, neodymium is really the key uh, element that's required. So for every tonne of neodymium supply that you, that you get out of the ground, you get another two, over two and a half tonnes of the other light rare earths, uh, about half a tonne of the heavy rare earths, and another half a tonne of yttrium. Of yttrium. Now, if you compare that to the demand side, for every ton of neodymium consumption that you have, if you apply this, um, this ratio, you get an oversupply of, um, of 0.6 tons of other light rare earth elements. And as you can see listed here, 0.2 of the other heavy uh, rare earths and 0.2 of yttrium. And this is this, it's this imbalance which really creates the, uh, the oversupply of materials. So as more and more... Um, rare earth uh, projects focus on uh, getting neodymium out of the ground and praseodymium, dysprosium to, a, to another certain degree, there's going to be this vast oversupply of other rare earth materials which is going to be created. Which just brings me to the end of my uh, presentation. Thank Thanks you very much, David. Uh, any questions? Richard. Yeah, very interesting to Thank you. Any comments about fuel cells as, a, as an alternate in this uh, mix for uh, sort of batteries? Was that? Uh, fuel cells are definitely an interesting technology. The, the, the investment that we're seeing being put in by First, the automotive manufacturers and the investment that's being put into the uh, battery cell manufacturing has, it seems like the industry has really made up its mind on what it wants to focus on. There is still a lot of, um, of research and development going into fuel cells, but maybe not within the next 10 to 15 year period. We expect fuel cells really to form uh, quite a minor part of this um, uh, or electric vehicle or, um, or kind of the next, the next stage of the automotive market. So though it's an important um, technology uh, in terms of maybe 30, 40 years moving on, uh, within this kind of intermediate uh, period, lithium-ion batteries and, and advanced lithium-ion battery technology seem to be the real focus for a lot of the automotive manufacturers. Because you could almost see it collapse in the platinum market. Mm. On a materials point of view, particularly if the, if the platinum market or the, the price of platinum does um, decrease quite substantially, but there's also a bit of a reluctance uh, in the un to kind of pay attention to the, the infrastructure which is required for a lot of these uh, hydrogen fuel cells. Y you could spend, um, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 and put in a, a high... Uh, a high voltage or high current um, charging station for an electric vehicle, or you could spend two million and put one equivalent for a, a hydrogen storage um, system in. So it really, again, t to be able to make it available to the mass uh, market, um, electric vehicles at this stage seem to be the much favoured technology. Okay. Uh, yes, David Crane, Imperial College. Um, in your estimates of the possible future sources of cobalt, did you consider marine sources at all? And if so, what were your conclusions? Um, I'll be honest, I'm not the cobalt analyst at Roskill. Um, uh, I can put you in touch with our cobalt analyst, though, and he can uh, give you a breakdown, really, of, the, uh, of where that supply is expected to come from. It seems to be that the, the use of electric cars and the restricted to um, 
relatively short distance commuter run or um, between close by towns. But in countries like Australia, much less, yep. the demand is far greater hmm. for greater distances. Is there any sign of a technology which will improve that? Um, battery ranges are increasing quite considerably and particularly the, the higher nickel um, cathode materials that I was talking of, the range of these battery cells is much greater. Using greater efficiency uh, motors as well maximizes the performance that you can get out of a single charge. It's likely that particularly lithium-ion battery electric vehicles will not be targeted at longer distance commuting um, uh, at first. Um, the targets really are for European-style driving and particularly um, Asian or, or the kind of Chinese-style driving where commutes really uh, are below 100 kilometres every day. Um, the US style of driving or, as you say, the Australian style of driving where you, you may be driving you know, hundreds of kilometres a day uh, every day, at the moment the technology really isn't there to... Um, to kind of meet those demands. But as technological advances kind of continue and we are seeing a lot of, um, a lot of added efficiencies, particularly in the battery, um, in the battery designs, uh, which is allowing more, uh, more battery cells or greater uh, energy density battery cells to, to be put in each EV model, uh, we could see ranges reaching those kind of style standards. Yeah. Great, thank you very much, David. Thank you. So, our final talk before lunch, uh, it's a great pleasure now to welcome Sean Bradley, who is a uh, Research Associate for Energy, Environment and Resources at the Royal Institute for International Affairs, or as it is universally known, Chatham House. Thank you, Sean. Great, thank you. Hi, right. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'm Sean Bradley. I'm a research associate um, at Chatham House. I work in the Energy, Environment and Resources Department. Um, so I'm a team of, one of a team of about 20, and we cover all aspects of the sustainable resource economy and climate change and obviously the international policy implications. Um, so that's where I'll focus my um, remarks uh, today. And so we'll quickly just run through what we can learn from the resource boom of, uh, of the last decade and a bit. Uh, how we might look ahead, and also how we might think about planning for a low-carbon future. Um, so I guess the first uh, message to, to make clear, and this has been picked up on by previous presentations, is you know, b between 2000 and 2015, we've seen the global resources landscape absolutely tra transformed. Um, trade increased by about 60%. Uh, the market grew from about $1.7 trillion to almost $5 trillion. And within that, metals and minerals uh, represent the sort of second largest um, component after fossil fuel trade. Um, so this is, all, this is data from a website that we've recently created at Chatham House. It's at www.resourcetrade.earth, but it maps all bilateral trade flows and different resources. Um, and we're about to update it with 2016 data, if anyone uh, is interested in that. Um, the primary driver of this growth, or one of the primary drivers of this growth, obviously, was China's demand and this has been referenced um, earlier this morning. Obviously, there are many you know, factors in this. One large factor was China's uh, accession to the World Trade Organization, and obviously it became very much the workshop um, of the world and started importing large amounts of raw materials. It also embarked on a massive economic stimulus and construction boom after the global financial crisis, uh, which massively increased raw material imports yet again. Um, and obviously this sits at the heart of the re renewable energy transition as well, if you think about China's power in solar and wind manufacturing um, and investment. Um, so this chart shows resource flows into China. It's all resource flows over $1 billion. Uh, you can see here China accounts for about half of um, global uh, metals and minerals imports. And you can see here the large trade flows, so iron ore from Australia, um, <coughs> copper and other metals from Peru and Latin America. Um, and, and so China really changed everything. Uh, one of our um, colleagues and um, uh, collaborators at Chatham House, David Humphreys, who many of you I'm sure know, in his book he has a chapter, China Changes Everything, and he talks about how mining executives back in 2000 were trying to predict the likely increase in steel uh, processing capacity, for instance, and at that point China was 
at around 125 billion tonnes, and they thought maybe 180, 200 by 2010. And in reality, it was well past 600 million tonnes. Um, so I, I just want to make the point, sometimes systemic or disruptive changes are very, very difficult to predict. They sit beyond uh, models and everyday expectations. Um, so the impacts of this uh, shift, obviously tightening markets, higher, more volatile prices. We saw resource politics come back, uh, you know, rise back up the, uh, the geopolitical agenda. Um, you can see here one uh, clear correlation is between the oil and gas and metals and minerals prices and investment arbitrations. So we saw disputes, investment disputes back on the rise. We also saw an increasing number of export bans and restrictions, taxes imposed on food, uh, metals particularly. Um, and there are a number of drivers of this. Um, beyond the obvious clear correlation between prices and the desire to, uh, for export countries to gain a, a windfall and economic benefit from um, those resources, there's obviously a, a much broader um, push towards building in, into linkages between mining, metals and minerals industries and the wider economy and developing uh, in-country beneficiation, in-country value addition. So building those linkages with your industrial and economic development plans. Now, where there were price increases, um, it's the major industrial um, importers, industrial consumers that, that bore the brunt of these. So this chart is just a quick snapshot of the top 10 countries by share of global mineral imports in 2011. Um, so you can see you've got a lot of the uh, advanced uh, high income countries that are quite resource poor there. And you've also got a lot of massive um, emerging uh, markets and industrial processing centers. Um, and there are clear impacts. I mean, we estimated that um, India's uh, export ban on iron ore back in 2011, which was widely interpreted to have added about 25% uh, or $40 a tonne to prices, we estimated that that would have added about $5 billion to the EU and Japan's import bill in that year, maybe as much as $30 billion to China's import bill. But it's a distributed impact, and it hits industries rather than consumers directly. So for that reason, uh, metals and minerals markets and the governance of them uh, has remained, uh, maybe lacks some political salience because it just doesn't hit consumers in the same way that food or fuel shortages um, do, despite the fact that actually disruption is really, really important um, and can have direct security impacts if you consider, for example, potash markets, as one presenter um, mentioned earlier, or strategic metals and minerals. Um, and that's particularly the case uh, thinking about low carbon transition. There is no greater threat to national and international security than climate change impacts, obviously. Um, so if we look at what we kind of learned from this period, I think shifting demand patterns and growing uh, rapid demand growth really exposed a lot of the gaps in um, global resource governance. Um, so this chart shows the evolution of global resource governance over time. Um, it's split out by different uh, sort of areas of governance and by eras, so Bretton Woods in the post-World War II um, era, globalization, the Washington Consensus, the global financial crisis and the resources boom. Um, when we say global resource governance, we're, we're talking to the, the sort of collection of international norms, rules, mechanisms, institutions, both the formal and the informal that, that guide and regulate resource production, trade and consumption. So that ranges from the systemic structural pieces, for instance, the World Trade Organization, uh, down to the very industry specific uh, pieces. So the International Energy Organization or the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. And as you can see, it's kind of evolved in response to events. So you can see um, around uh, here, OPEC and IEA around the oil crisis. You can see a cluster of um, sustainability initiatives and mechanisms emerging as the environmental and social impacts of additional <coughs> resource production and trade uh, and the strain that that was placing on economic um, environmental systems became clear. Um, and the key point really is that there's, there's considerable gaps in terms of addressing some of the challenges that we've seen where um, export restrictions have emerged, for instance. They fall outside of the World Trade Organization rules when they refer to natural resources in many instances. Um, where early warning um, and uh, emergency response mechanisms are concerned. And also where data sharing um, and tech sharing are concerned. Um, there's also a general absence of governance directly relating to the metals and minerals industries in, in most instances. So that's what's within this um, 
red box here. Most of it tends to be commercially held data, proprietary data, it's behind paywalls. There's not a lot out there in the public domain. Um, uh, so it's certainly a more challenging um, sector to, to map. And there's also not a lot of interlinkages between different areas of the system. So obviously between uh, climate mechanisms and energy systems, there's a, a much more developed conversation because of the obvious role that um, fossil fuels play in causing emissions and obviously the role that energy transition plays in meeting or delivering a two degree world. Equally where forest governance is concerned, the role of forests as carbon sinks. But there's, there's not really a, an established uh, conversational dialogue between metals and minerals industries, mining industries and climate um, dialogues. So where next? Um, so this uh, chart, I mean, I think the first point to make is that the transition to a low carbon economy, um, it's multifaceted. It has many, many dimensions. This is a chart from the new climate economy. It uh, illustrates sustainable infrastructure needs. Um, the difference between a business as usual trajectory um, and, a, and a two degree scenario. Um, so there's six plus six trillion a year to 2030. 60% uh, of that is energy and transport. And it spans a really, really broad area, a uh, range of areas. It means less investment in primary energy, so fossil fuel, um, uh, fossil fuel systems, um, and all the metals and material implications that, that go with that. It means more energy efficiency, so smart buildings, energy, transport, uh, and it means low carbon core infrastructure, and that's not just delivering renewable energy, but it's delivering CCS, which obviously plays a huge role in most um, two degree uh, scenarios, climate proofing, core infrastructure, as well as a host of other areas. Um, and I, I had a quick scan of um, some of these sort of core documents uh, yesterday, and if you look for mining within them, it, it, it doesn't appear, with the exception of maybe the reduction of unsustainable subsidies. Uh, metals and minerals implications are not really part of the conversation, even when there's calls for very, very large um, amounts of investment. Um, so my comments from here on will generally refer to renewable energy technologies, but um, I just wanted to make that point and, and set the conversation in its wider context. Um, so what do we know so far? Well, first of all, the speed and scale um, of renewable energy uptake has been repeatedly under-modelled um, in recent years. These charts are um, the International Energy Agency's new policy scenario. So that's their central energy scenario. It builds uh, on policies already announced by countries. And what you can see is the, the dotted line is the historical trend. And then with each year up, you can see the revision that's, that's been made. And so you can see market developments outpacing policy announcements year on year on year on year. And at the same time, if I were to show you um, the fossil fuel demand uh, trajectory, the equal and opposite uh, picture is true. So you have the incumbent technologies generally um, sort of a bias towards that, and those, those, those numbers are revised down year on year. Um, projections for electric vehicles uh, appear to be following a similar trajectory. So this is something compiled by one of my um, colleagues. It just shows the range of current uh, projections in terms of uh, the percentage of the global fleet. Um, so that's 1.2 billion cars. Um, that will be electric by 2040. The solid line is the current projection and the dotted one is last year's. So you can see the scale of the, of the upwards revision year on year. So what does all of this mean for metals and minerals um, demand for the mining sector um, is the key question. Well, scenarios for metals and minerals demand are increasingly emerging. Um, Obviously, there's the work of the International Resource Panel and other actors who have been looking at the aggregate impacts in these demand trajectories for some time. Um, but we're now seeing a growing uh, number of um, actors, including multilateral banks, looking at what it means for investment development for the wider resource economy um, and looking at those supply-side interactions, so not the, the classic focus on supply shortages um, that have been the focus of critical min minerals discussions or um, investor or consumer dialogues. Um, and the key point here to make really is that they all rely on a lot of assumptions. First of all, between and within technologies. Um, so obviously, um, different wind technologies have different material implications. So a shift from onshore geared turbine windmills to offshore direct drive windmills means uh, more demand for rare um, and at rare earths, um, the shift from crystalline silicon solar, which is currently 85% of the market, to thin film technologies um, could mean more indium, less silver, and storage, uh, where grid utility cell storage, um, but also 
electric vehicles are concerned, obviously we, we see a shift towards um, lithium-ion batteries, um, more lithium, more cobalt, more nickel, more manganese, depending on the chemistry, uh, less lead. And obviously there are efficiency uh, improvements, assumptions over time. So that's sort of today and tomorrow's tech choices. They also entail much bigger um, uh, questions about what the future look like, uh, might look like. So uh, what is the future of power? You know, if, if you have a series of interconnected grids um, or you have a more decentralized system, uh, there are huge implications for base metal uh, demand. The future of mobility, um, the number of vehicles on the road and the rate of fleet uh, turnover, business models and new technologies, ride sharing, the way people choose to um, move from A to B, uh, they're, they're changing that and the future may not look um, as it does today. How we choose to live, so a rapidly urbanizing population, mass transit systems, smart demand. Um, and obviously over time, and uh, Roman mentioned this earlier about saturation um, points, but you know, we, we do need to start thinking about secondary markets and circular economy approaches and the speed and scale of, um, of growth of these. Now, at the same time, there's a very different conversation emerging uh, in the mainstream media, among uh, commercial consumers, um, which revolves around speculation of a forthcoming supply crunch. So on the right-hand side here are just a handful of um, headlines from the last couple of months from the Financial Times. Um, I, th I think most of them are probably from Henry Sanderson, and I know he's speaking tomorrow, so he can go into more detail on them. But it's... Um, it, it, it just demonstrates that the market is already responding. There's surging M&A um, activity. Um, we've seen lithium uh, deposits in West Africa being traded for 2,000 times their acquisition price in the space of a year um, in, the, in the last year. Soaring valuations, Australian lithium miners, their, st their stock uh, prices rising by three, 400 percent, rapidly rising prices. We've seen consumer attempts to lock in supply, so Volkswagen tried to negotiate a uh, long-term cobalt uh, supply contract unsuccessfully just recently and we're also seeing rising awareness of political and environmental and social and governance risks so had I have updated this this morning I would have added the fact that obviously the the, um, the LME the London Metal Exchange is now um, considering an inquiry into child labour and cobalt supply chains and we can see that these have real feedback loops um, on the kinds of demand that are created so Consumers and uh, R&D and innovation looking to reduce the amount of cobalt uh, required in cathodes, for example, to reduce exposure to those really, really tricky markets. Um, there's, there's an obvious reason for all of these concerns. Um, they're driven by market structures, the concentration of producer countries. Uh, so this is the current production of the core inputs, uh, minus graphite actually, core inputs to um, lithium-ion batteries. Um, there's also consumer, uh, sorry, company concentration. So the lithium market, for instance, 85% of production is controlled by four companies. So you can see a scramble of um, junior miners and also major miners trying to get into that space. There's generally opaque market structures where they're very small markets of a billion dollars, three billion dollars, for instance, compared to the big base metals markets, which are in the tens or hundreds of billions. Um, they're often over-the-counter deals. The price discovery mechanisms aren't that transparent. So there's a lot of unknowns. And also the complexity of supply chains, um, which the last presentation um, picked up on. There's, there's every argument to say that the, the bottlenecks may well emerge at the midstream rather than the production end um, of the supply chain. And all of these concerns are compounded by sort of sector-wide and data knowledge constraints. And I just wanted to show this chart. Um, this is from... Bloomberg, because it, it shows how very, very small shifts in assumptions can really, really change the message that you um, derive about uh, when supply crunches might happen, um, when supply needs to come online. Um, so the top line there is the highest um, available um, estimate of lithium reserves. And the bottom line is the lowest. Um, USGS current uh, estimates are about here. And then the solid lines are the range of different uh, assumed consumptions for batteries. Um, so you can see that depending on the, the materials consumption, depending on the reserve estimates, and depending on the size of car fleet as well, this is based on the Bloomberg New Energy forecast, which is at the very high end of that EV um, chart that I showed you a minute ago, you, you can come to very, very, very different questions, uh, well, questions and answers. Um, so there's a range of hard constraints here which involve uh, the availability of geological and production data, 
Um, the range, uh, the quality of data on resources, reserves, the availability and the credibility of production data, and also an accurate assessment of timeframes um, between demand growth and the time to bring resources to market. So what can we say with certainty if, if everything is so uncertain? Well, a low carbon future will definitely be material intensive and even with increased recycling rates, there will clearly be a need to um, bring resources to, to, to market. Um, a handful of key commodities have dominated the debate, I think, lithium, cobalt, rare earth um, elements, but there will be systems-wide impacts um, for major base metals and other materials, uh, construction materials, aggregate particularly, and they will exacerbate very well-known environmental, social um, and governance risks. Um, at the same time, of course, the shift to renewable energy um, it has been proposed as sort of shifting one dependency uh, for fossil fuels to another, critical metals and minerals. Um, while there is a vital distinction to be drawn between uh, fuel inputs, so operating inputs to energy security, and capital inputs, so you know, one-time uh, inputs, um, I think it's fair to say that as the interlinkages between metals and minerals, um, governance and energy governance and climate governance become a lot, lot clearer, uh, we can see metals and minerals rising back up the political agenda. Um, and, and while the constraints of these current demand and supply uh, trajectories, tra trajectories are very, very clear, they do hold great value as a means of creating dialogue between mining metals, um, energy and climate communities and inf informing uh, where research and where policy um, thinking should go next. So uh, just a few words on um, planning for the future. I know I'm keenly aware that I'm standing between us and lunch at the moment, so <laughs> I'll rattle through this. Um, but in terms of uh, what, we can, uh, what, what we can say with certainty, obviously the, the challenge is how do we support the foundations for flexible and resilient supply in the context of uncertainty. We know that there are certain key challenges and time frames, so supply security certainly and critical metals inputs in the um, short to medium term, but equally the availability of and the access to key technologies in mining, at the production side, uh, in manufacturing, and in recycling. And so there are a handful of key areas for action, um, which include improved dialogue uh, and information, new approaches to sustainable um, production, and also supporting research and development and innovation. Um, so improved dialogues and information. Why? Um, ultimately, because you, you, you need a better uh, sort of underpinning of information to uh, support international cooperation, um, avoid the misperceptions uh, that can lead to political and trade tensions, and also to effectively integrate mining uh, and metals and minerals into wider climate and sustainable um, development dialogues. Now, I, I won't go into all of these because um, there's, there's a lot of detail there. We can come back to this um, in the discussion later. Um, but I would say that sort of building knowledge of low carbon value chains, particularly where metals families are concerned, where critical metals are byproducts of other base uh, metal production, and where circular economy approaches and new technologies can, can fundamentally change the, the, the supply patterns and market structures, uh, and particularly where transparency and accountability is concerned. So increasing um, visibility across the supply chain and understanding where risk sits, um, I think is key. And who needs to be involved in the conversation? Um, I think the, the first um, part of the presentation makes clear that obviously it's very difficult to have an effective um, mining metals and minerals uh, governance uh, and market conversation without establishing an appropriate role for China, given its weight in the market. Um, there are obvious shared interests, for instance, between the China and EU and Germany with um, clear uh, similarities in terms of manufacturing and industrial bases. Um, and also there's a question of what um, international policy processes such as the um, G20 can play. Um, they have in recent years mandated enhanced data and dialogue around oil markets in response to excessive price volatility um, following the global financial crisis. They asked the International Energy Forum uh, to create the Joint Oil Data Initiative. Is there an argument that something similar should happen around metals and minerals markets? Um, the second big area, which is actually the focus of a, a, a large percentage of my current research, is um, thinking about new approaches to sustainable development. And I think we do have to approach the mining sector um, and its economic linkages in a very, very different way in a decarbonising world. Um, we uh, obviously 
for, for obvious reasons, we see a conversation about expanding and diversifying production for the low-carbon economy. We see multilateral banks moving into this area, and it makes perfect sense, given their uh, rapidly increasing climate commitments. Um, and there are big questions about how we understand trade-offs between biodiversity, carbon sinks, and other impacts that the mining sector can have, uh, and also how uh, multilaterals like the World Bank or the EBRD might partner and work with uh, emerging actors such as the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, how common standards might be derived. I think there's a need to rethink extractives-led growth as a concept uh, for a carbon-constrained world. I think that means managing expectations um, and not hyping uh, low-carbon commodities as the, the, next, ne the next great um, growth opportunity for countries until we understand what that is. It also means rethinking uh, how you decarbonize and how you minimize direct indirect emissions from the sector, and also how it interlinks with other areas of the economy. So many of the classic um, high carbon industrial uh, linkages that countries have attempted to create in recent years, um, do they still make sense in light of nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement or sustainable development goals? Um, and ultimately, this, getting this right all works towards a kind of win-win where you deliver sustainable low carbon development, but you also reduce the risk of disputes with producer countries um, and damaging supply disruptions, uh, investment and trade disputes. Um, and just one final word on supporting research and development and innovation. This is a, a, a quick reimagining of what the circular economy might look like for mining uh, metals and minerals. I, I won't go into it um, in any depth. Um, there is a report forthcoming on this from my colleagues at Chatham House, um, so I can point you all to that in time. But. Um, a clear message that uh, we need to improve data uh, and dialogue, rethink extractive low growth trajectories, uh, and also support uh, the transition, because it's not um, exclusively about digging it out of the ground, but thinking about that, that longer term transition and what sort of system, material system and economic system that we want to transition to. Thank you. Um, you're right, lunch is next, but don't let that put you Slightly off. Late. You've got one or two <laughs> questions. Any questions for Sean? Richard? Yeah, Sean, it's very uh, interesting that you're talking about the fact that the, uh, if you like, the sort of new infrastructure of, of, of where we're going, mm. the, the resource implications of mm. that have not been modern. It's something that you know, I've been thinking about for a while. But you know, we've got these models, but we're not thinking about our, 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 our new city is going to be like the... You know, we're just modelling them based on the fact we're going to make more of the same stuff yeah. that we've got now. Precisely. And, uh, you know, I think it, it's absolutely right that we try and build better ideas of where we're going to go to and then put that back into the whole chain. And I've talked to a number of people and nobody has, has done those figures, really. So mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're modelling stuff. So we, we may be growing things that are not going to grow. They're not, they're not going to be like that. So yeah. our, our models can be completely wrong. This, I mean, this is something that we're working extensively on and, and speaking to a lot of other actors within the wider community that creates uh, energy and climate models uh, and other resources. And I think, two, I mean, one thing that is quite well known, I think, or becoming better known now, is um, the fact that scenarios are, are not really, um, you know, they shouldn't be read as forecasts. They are projections of an unsustainable trend, and they also need to be read um, as a series. Uh, so I quite often, um, I, I do a lot of work looking at coal and carbon-intensive um, systems, and I quite often hear uh, industry and, and coal-trading nations talk about the IEA scenarios, but uh, which, which one is it? Um, because one puts us on track for a five, six degree world, one is what is currently announced, um, and, and one is where we need to be headed for a, for a sustainable future. Um, so, so I think understanding the range of scenarios and using that to inform decision making, I think also understanding what is beyond the scope of scenarios. So increasingly um, in conversations with multilateral banks and donors and also with low income, middle income countries in the context of development assistance, um, we hear requests from across the system to uh, not project these kind of uh, never-ending demand <laughs> curves. You know, when does efficiency kick in? When do new business models, new technologies change the way people uh, consume? And does the path for 
many low-income countries look like that of uh, the OECD countries, China, India. Um, it arguably doesn't in many sectors. Um, so I think a lot more thinking needed in those spaces. One just last point also. I don't see anybody putting uh, implications for biodiversity to any of this as well, because obviously the, yeah. if you switch from one to another, all the implications of, of the mining and what you do and so on, and uh, I think we need to kind of wake up and put those things in there as well. It's not just climate, it's, it's all yeah. the other stuff, this system, earth system services really. Yeah, exactly. I fully agree with that. Um, and I think particularly where there are interlinkages between the climate and the biodiversity agendas, carbon sinks and areas of critical importance, I think that's quite an easy lever to pull to sort of raise awareness and, and build the policy momentum. But I, I would agree it's a much wider systems question. I think these are topics we can come back to in this, uh, particularly maybe in the uh, discussion session after lunch, this interplay between projections and scenarios and mm -hmm. trajectories and where we want to be going rather than just <coughs> where we think we might be going and responding to that, that, that feedback between the two is really critical, isn't it? We've got about an hour for discussion um, following the five talks this morning uh, and the idea really is to pick up the sorts of things we've been talking about, particularly around global uh, supply and demand trends. Uh, we're going to start off with some panel discussion and then I'll bring in the uh, the rest of you and, and encourage you all to join in with that. So as our panellists, we've got three of our speakers from this morning, Peter Bukholz, Sean um, and David Manning. And then we're joined by uh, Andrew Bloodworth, who's one of the conveners of the meeting. He is Science Director for Minerals and Waste at the British Geological Survey. Um, Andrew is a founder member of the UK Minerals Forum um, and has contributed, among many other projects, to a uh, the Government Office of Science Foresight Project on Land Use Futures uh, and is a former mining advisor to DFID, the Department for International Development. So uh, I'm going to start off by asking Andrew to share a few thoughts on uh, following this morning's talks, then we'll get into some panel discussion uh, and then it'll be your chance to contribute too. Andrew, thank you. Thanks, Nick. Can, I, can everybody hear me? I've got a kind of loud voice, so I probably don't need the mic. Um, Thank, it's, it's great to be here, and it's, it's great to be uh, sitting here with such a sort of diverse audience um, at, at a meeting at the Geological Society. It's really good that we've got people from uh, not, just, uh, not just the usual suspects, so um, it's, it's, that's, that's, that's really good, and it's, a, it's fascinating. It's been a very interesting morning. Um, I was asked to provide some reflections, my goodness, um, life, the universe, and everything. Um, <laughs> I think uh, what I might get in the very strong impression, uh, a world in transition. Um, all of a sudden, our world uh, seems to be changing very quickly. Um, and the profound implications it has on the context of, of this meeting, really. Um, the march of renewables, um, the imminent drop off a cliff that the automotive sector is going to do worldwide as it transforms itself from internal combustions to electric propulsion. Um, and just how unpredictable some of these things are and how they're, they're very, very much impacted by other forces. Um, things we need to think about like um, if we are going to transform to renewables, what does that do to power grids and how we use these, these systems? Um, business models for electric vehicles and, how, and, and the impact that that might have. Um, it's almost like we're at a sort of VHS Betamax moment. You know, we've got to jump and, 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 and decide where, which way we're going to go. Um, the other thing I took from this morning was... Um, the sort of time and space paradigm around differing rates of industrialization, where particular economies or particular regions are in the in the economic uh, in their economic development, and how that impacts on the palette of raw materials that they use and the volume of raw materials that they use. Um, I thought there was quite an interesting stuff around. Um, saturation. Uh, I, I mean, I've read stuff elsewhere about peak stuff, 
you know, we've got to peak stuff and, and that, and that um, um, we may well find ourselves, um, you know, saturated out in terms of demand for, for things. And I think the other thing was that came across very strongly from a couple of speakers was how all the, we, the materials are just one of a whole set of interlinked systems. Water, food, energy, but also things like the importance of supply chains. It's not just what's in the ground, it's how we get it to the market. And also how that interacts with the human world, the, the world of human affairs um, in terms of um, geopolitics and governance. And then layered on top of that as an additional complicating factor is the, the biggest imperative of all, which is climate change and the need to do something about it. Um, and we talked a lot about the sort of poster boys for materials like lithium, the rare earths, and cobalt. But a couple of speakers made the point very powerfully that we can't forget about all the other things that we need food being one of them, and the importance of some minerals in food production. And also that we rely enormously on infrastructure and the steel and concrete that, that a lot of that's made from. Um, I think that's probably a rather rambling reflection on this morning. It's, it's quite a protein-rich morning, I thought. <laughs> Lots and lots of information, lots and lots of different perspectives, very powerful, uh, very powerful stuff. Um, this stuff really matters. Um, I think we have a massive challenge in how we communicate the complexity of some of these issues to policymakers and to people who make decisions and to people we meet in the pub or in the supermarket. Um, one of the things I'm always saying is, you know, do, do we recognise the resource consequences of our conspicuous consumption? Um, so, yeah, the other thing, yeah, there was one more thing. I've written it here big, data. Um, we need to parameterize this stuff. And I think, again, two or three speakers made the point about how data is really important. Data has become really unglamorous. You know, people don't want to fund data collection anymore. And we somehow need to get that across to policymakers, people who have money and who will fund these things, that it's really important that we collect. I mean, Peter showed some fantastic graphs of time series data from to up to two centuries ago. And, you know, somebody back then took a decision to collect that data and pay for the collection of that data. And that's really, really important. And it's really important. Once we stop collecting time series data, that's it. We've broken the time series. We can't, we can't put that back again. So... The metrics are important as well. And don't forget about all those non-geological factors. And on that note, I'll pass it on to my... Yeah. Well, thank you very much. People who really know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I, there's, I mean, there's, you picked up a number of the same <coughs> themes that, that I had from, from this morning. And I think there's a lot of useful ideas to pick up there. Um, the, the two points which you made there, which I think would be good not just to pick up now but actually we'll come back to tomorrow afternoon are uh, around the the communications challenge and indeed that that point about data and funding and sharing it because there we're starting to tap into this who do we need to engage in this wider enterprise uh, you framing that enterprise being able to say what it is and then communicating it and then getting the the wherewithal the, the, the building the capital that you need to to make a roadmap if we can build one uh, achievable. So those would be really useful topics to come back to tomorrow if we don't do so now. Um, any other reflections from, from uh, if the three of you wanted to share some thoughts on talks you've heard this morning, cross-cutting links? Well, I think I, I would certainly agree with Andrew that this has been a, a fascinating and, and protein-rich diet we've been fed this morning. I'm not going to say very much because I want to hear what comes from the, the floor in due course. But I was struck by the idea of the uh, geolonomics uh, as, as another way of describing economic geology. And, of course, economic geology has been around uh, since the year dot, uh, certainly as a, a title and a title of a journal and all the rest of it. Uh, so uh, this, 
Association of Geology and Economics is one which has got an added zest to it at the present time, perhaps more than it has in the past. And what I've found really rewarding about the conversations I've had in the room um, and listening to the talks this morning is how much more interest there is from those who come from an economics background uh, than there may have been in the past. And maybe I haven't noticed it in the past, but I'm certainly seeing it now in a way which I think is incredibly important. Because we're all trying to solve the same problems. It doesn't matter which discipline we come from, we're trying to solve the same problems. And I think we all know that from our own individual disciplines, we cannot do it. We have to do it working with other people, working with people we don't often converse with. And, and that's a message which really has to go into, um, uh, speaking as someone who works in a university, it has to go into the funders' uh, ears. Um, we have the funding in, in the British system, of course, is partitioned between the different research councils. They'll all come under one roof, but of course that doesn't mean to say they'll talk to each other. Um, but it does mean that we, we are inhibited because the present way of thinking prevents the type of conversation we're having in this room today. So we need to change in that respect. I'll stop there. I, I was struck with, uh, by geolonomics as well, and in a sense it's not so, if, it's, if this is something coming from an economist rather than from a geologist, as you say, economic geology is very familiar territory to geologists, but it's interesting that interest is coming the other way. And also that Raymond talked about um, geolonomics referring to um, demand end issues as well as supply end. So it's actually starting to bring those disciplines together on the whole picture and not just, well, we're the geologists and this is the bit we do. We just get the stuff out of the ground, is it right? Uh, Sean. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I mean, I, I agree with much of that. And I, three points that I would, would add. Um, uh, maybe pointers, also questions, because I would be really, really interested to hear everybody else's thoughts on on these, uh, these issues. But I, I mean, I think the first point is around drivers of demand. And um, I think there's a tendency, especially around the current conversations about how metals and minerals um, demand changes in a low carbon economy, that many actors are still looking at um, supply and demand fundamentals prices. And actually there's a, you know, a whole host of intangible factors around environmental and social governance risks. Um, that are hard to quantify, but I mean, I think increasingly in financial markets, we've seen ESG risk move from being a, um, a, a de-risking uh, piece to, a, to an actual area of growth. It's kind of a, a, a beta kind of investing strategy. Um, it, it has real impact. Um, and also it, it drives innovation. So where cobalt is concerned, for instance, um, we, we see the conversations uh, around child labor and around many of the supply chain risks. And the London Metals Exchange and, and other uh, actors are wary of uh, exposure to this and, um, and are looking to investigate that. And then on the research and development side, you see um, actions, uh, activity to reduce dependence of cobalt and battery chemistries. So the market does respond to these risks and some of them sit outside the classic supply and demand um, dynamics. Um, the, the second point I would make in terms of development and this pathway up the industrial um, curve and the, the resource demand trajectory. Um, Raymond uh, made some very, very good points about the saturation points earlier and uh, you know where demand will emerge from next. And this is something that I've been asked many times by Chinese policymakers. You know, when does India emerge to pick up some of the slack and rebalance markets? When do the big um, populous African nations pick up that slack? I think it's really, really important to unpack um, what we mean by saturation because there's saturation on the current development pathway and then there's um, developing differently. And we've already seen that in some sectors um, around telecoms, uh, banking in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance. They, they didn't roll out wires and, and poles and, you know, that, that has material uh, implications. We can already see that. Um, and the final point, uh, Andrew's point actually, about layers of complexity, I think, um, and actually you've just touched on this, it's about breaking people out of their silos. So uh, as I mentioned, we can already see energy and climate communities working you know, very closely together for obvious reasons, because energy systems contribute such a massive um, part of the problem, and they also represent uh, a large part of the solution. Um, we can see it around forest governance, um, 
we need to sort of bridge the gap with um, metals and mining communities and, and, and all of the various actors there and, and, and get them out of uh, that silo and interacting with, you know, what, what do you want from a sustainable development trajectory? What does demand look like in the future? Um, maybe moving from a supply side perspective, I frequently have conversations in resource rich um, developing economies that revolve around what resources do you have and how do you leverage those uh, into economic uh, development and prosperity? An equal and opposite question, and one that is increasingly asked, is what, what do you want as a society? You, you know, people don't want coal, uh, they, they, they don't want iron ore, they want heat, warmth, lighting, mm. um, all of these uh, services. So I think asking the question from the other um, end of the, of the supply chain is really, really valuable, and you need to bring together a wider group of people to do that. Thank you very much. <coughs> and Peter? Yes, uh, I would like to um, come back to our roots as geologists and want to add uh, some aspect Andrew mentioned on providing data, fundamental data, um, and based on that data, you know, all that modeling uh, is, is going, has going to start. And I'll back in a second to go to my chair. I would like to show you um, the, I hope it's in there. There it is. Um, we've just uh, published um, our raw materials information system. Um, and I want to raise this topic that the geological surveys all over the world and are sitting on lots of data. And this raw materials information system was um, been able to compile with the support of the BGS and a great thank you for Andrew for, for your support by the USGS. And we've, we've approached um, various uh, companies and associations, especially the uh, study groups, plus uh, various other um, uh, commercial associations uh, to, to let us publish some of their data as BGR and BGS, and we are all in this group of the International Consultative Group of, on Statistics for Mineral Raw Materials. So we are sitting on, have, on compiled data, using data from various sources, but it's difficult to publish. So we've been active for one year, almost one year, to clarify copyright issues with all these players. So finally, this is a publication of the BGR database, which includes BGS data, USGS data, and so on. It's probably the best, uh, it's called ROSES, a Raw Materials Information System, it can only be published in German language. That's one of the prerequisites by some of the players anyway. Um, it shows maps. Um, and, and, and time series on mineral production and demand. Uh, so it's a nice tool to play around and get maps. And that's a starting point as we are here in the geological society um, to, to provide you know, uh, just fundamental data. So that's one step. And from there, uh, maybe one comment to all the modeling that we do. Um, I believe that um, all these four sites, you know, like for a period for the next five years, the next maybe the next ten years, are quite valid and they're probably, I wouldn't say accurate, but they are sort of if you look at a range of possibilities, the the reality will be will most probably be within that range that we model with. <coughs> Beyond 10 years ahead, uh, I, I don't believe this works uh, because the, the dynamics are so quickly changing, the parameters are quickly changing, but it's part of our monitoring. And uh, that's why we have these conferences year by year and observing what's really happening in the markets. But the scenarios are very valuable. And what we find in also at DERA where we try to match supply 
scenarios with demand scenarios that we are missing the demand scenarios and there's a lot more work to do on this um, engaging and we as geologists and mining engineers also at DERA a bunch of us is from that crowd um, we have to learn to more interact with the economists and the technology side um, because that's where the music plays Raw material markets are demand-driven, and when we look at the German industry, they are not miners, they are manufacturers. So we have to talk to the manufacturers, mm -hmm. and we have to start to talk to them on the upper side of the supply chain. That's where, where we, we advise company, companies, and, but we are coming from this mining side, and the great challenge is to bridge uh, these players in the supply chain. So that's a major job for the future. Well, thank you. I think at this point uh, I'll invite comments from the audience and we haven't got people standing around waiting to rove with the mics. So I'm going to ask you to... I'm going to test this is working. I'm going to ask if people want to, to say something, I'll pass, it, pass the mic and if you can pass them on to people, that would be useful. So, who has a, a comment or a question or something they'd like to get into the conversation? Um, I'm very concerned about lithium. At the moment, we only really have one reliable locality for it, and I was wondering what we're going to do if and when that runs out. Does anyone have a comment on lithium? What do you mean by one source? Well, the main, the main source at the moment seems to be Chile, which produces 50% of the world's lithium from that source alone. The rest comes from elsewhere, but that is, has been the main supplier of lithium up till now, as far as I'm aware. Um, yeah, I'll just make a comment. Um, Greenbush is producing about 30% of the world's lithium at the moment. Pretty, pretty secure supply. They're going to double their production in Western Australia. You're, you're, you're happy with the current supplies? So they're, they're investing several hundred million dollars to improve supply. Okay. Uh, that, um, from pegmatites. I mean, also some of the, some of the um, brine producers. There's been $150 million spent last year for lithium exploration. So there's going to be a lot, there's going to be a lot of production coming on stream. Uh, yes, but the lithium is the, is the primary source for the power sources that we've been talking about this morning. We've got further comments on this, I think. Richard first, and then I'll go to... <coughs> Wait till two o'clock, I've got something to show you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then the other Richard behind Richard, you had something to add. That's, that's what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, do you want to add something? I was just going to comment that a few years ago with the rare earth elements, you could have said exactly the same. And over five years, the amount of recognized resources of rare earth elements uh, improved by five times because there was an exploration boom after 2010. I am sure the same thing is going to happen with lithium. And I have no doubt that there's considerable resources in the trust waiting to be found. Uh, thank you for your reassurance. But in fact, is it not true that many of the rare earths that we're talking about and rely upon come from one particular mine right in the north of China. It's very true, but that's, there are economic and political reasons why that's the case. It doesn't mean the rare earth resources don't exist. Oh, they exist all right, but how long are they going to last? Rare earths, I can't remember what the figures are, but the resources now defined, which is only a fraction of the deposits known, are enough to supply us for a considerable amount of time, if any of them could get to the stage of being mined. But that's a political, economic, and technical problem, not a problem around resources that exist. OK, thank you. Um, anyone else uh, on another to this or another topic? I just saw So I just think we need to remember that resources are a dynamic entity as well. 
So when we talk about known resources, if we talk resource sensor stricto, that is a concentration that has a reasonable prospect of economic extraction. Now, if we start running out of lithium, which I don't think we will, the cost is going to go up. So more things will slide into that resource category because they've got a reasonable prospect. So I think the economics will make sure that we get supply. I don't think we're going to rip all the lithium out the Earth's crust and it's all gone. Did you want to I'm comment? I'm going to start a different topic. So one, one thing on this. Sean, just one final point on this. I think this highlights the, uh, the importance of understanding where risk sits in the value chain because I think the immediate um, response of, of, of the markets and of, and of most commentators is to look at supply. Um, and actually, lithium, um, it's not like many exchange-traded metals in that it is a custom product. It's quite bespoke what goes to different manufacturers and different uses. So there's an equal argument for looking at the midstream and the processing industries, of around 70% of which future investment is currently in China, which you know, is, is, is one valid question, whether um, how you distribute that globally and, and where you should be looking at scaling investment and ensuring a, a diverse and secure um, supply chain through the midstream as well as the upstream. Um, so I was really struck <coughs> this morning in, in, I think, three of the talks, maybe four, um, there were references to um, these supply and demand uh, projections or even assessments of where we are at the minute in terms of, of potash um, and of organize institutions, governance organizations looking at that and going, well, that, that looks fine then because overall supply seemed to, to meet overall demand. But the, the different stories that came through the different resources about what happened when you lifted the bonnet up and where the problems really lay, either to do with where it sat in the supply chain, or to do with differential demand in different places, or to do with what sorts of materials you needed, or whatever, make for a far more complex picture. And actually, if you're looking at real um, bottlenecks in terms of supply, real constraints, that's often where those issues are going to to be. Can I just uh, reply to that a little bit, a thought that comes to mind. Um, the importance of data is, is absolutely vital. I, I would wholeheartedly agree with colleagues from the surveys, and I would be the first to beat the drum for continuing to fund the collection of data. But the interesting thing about the data concerning, for example, the fertilizers, which Nick alludes to, is that they may be in the public domain. There's not enough in the public domain. But the data which are in the public domain are inconsistent between the different organizations. And it's actually another problem, which is how do we manage to make these data that are available to us work together? Because there's a huge amount of effort that needs to go into actually deciphering them. And that is, I think, one reason why the problem that Nick alludes to exists. So there's work to be done. Uh, uh, it's a case of getting people to talk to each other rather more, but that can only be convincing once we demonstrate there's a need to do this and, uh, and I think that is uh, uh, that is very telling the issue of peak um, materials comes to mind I mean, we, we, the, the whole story of peak phosphorus is a, is a phantom because um, the way uh, phosphate reserves were um, presented changed I think it was 2009 and the um, uh, reserves went up by a factor of 30 or something like that simply because of the stroke of a pen somewhere in London so, so the idea of peak phosphorus you just forget about it even though people are still talking about it it's not a problem Francis you were going to kick us off in a different direction I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the rate of change of technologies because that seems to be something that's happening is technologies are changing faster and faster and so presumably the elements that we need to satisfy those will keep changing faster too. So for example, um, compact fluorescent lamps have kind of been and gone and now we're all using LEDs. And well, how I think it was 10 years you said you thought we could predict the future, but that seems to be a challenge for the supply industry is how to respond quickly when there are real step changes in technologies. 
it, in, it indeed is a problem. Um, exactly what you mentioned, the, uh, the, 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 the bulbs, the mercury bulbs and the LEDs. Um, within five, eight year times, it uh, demand increase. Oh, the technology completely changed. And to open up a mine does take today probably rather 15 years than five to 10 years, what we said, you know, 10 years ago. So um, we will get these demand shocks, which will impa have an impact on price. So you will, especially for these minor metals or metals that are, have a high market concentration, um, where you don't find quickly new suppliers, you will get price shocks. That will motivate other companies to invest in exploration and mining and to overcome the deficit. And that's the mechanism for the base metals like copper, lead, zinc, and so on. There, uh, we do not expect price shocks or demand shocks like this because it takes much longer to build up infrastructure and for those metals that are needed. So one has to, again, look at each commodity in a different way and try to figure out what's coming next. I think the other thing about that is it's not just a technology change, it's technology uptake. So we've known that rare earth magnets in, in electric motors are probably going to go into electric vehicles. And, we've, and, and some of us in the business, as it were, have been talking about this for a decade. And now all of a sudden it's happening because the automotive sector has, has decided that they're going to have this whole shelf shift in technology. And that's going to mean this increase in demand. So it, it, it's again, it's a bit this VHS beta max thing. You know, when, when manufacturers decide to jump and perhaps consumers decide that they're going to buy then that's when we see these huge spikes. It's like the mobile phone revolution in the 90s. When I, w I worked in Namibia in the 90s, and we literally overnight had thousands and thousands of small-scale miners, artisanal miners, working tin or, or tantalum-bearing pegmatites just appeared overnight. And it was when the price of tantalum went up by 20 times or something because mobile phones all, all, also all of a sudden became the must-have item. It's, it's a very interesting idea that the artisanal mining sector, which with all the problems that potentially brings with it, was able to react. Well, that's it. artisanals rapidly. can always react quicker than anybody else. We'll, we'll have a talk <laughs> on artisanal <laughs> mining. Literally over morning. <laughs> Richard, you may have a relevant yeah, point. Yeah, on this. Uh, exactly. So, um, uh, in the light of these technology adaptions and changes, that uh, the pressure on the mining. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, the, the, the technology changes that sort of put the mining industry under pressure because at the moment obviously the mining industry is very much dominated by uh, publicly stock listed companies who have to go through vast um, compliance stages to then go finally into production after a certain time. Um, is, there, is there an opinion in the panel maybe that the uh, percentage share of the uh, production market uh, is going to maybe trend m or the, the, the share of the private companies has maybe increased because they certainly have an edge over um, publicly traded companies uh, in, the, in the terms that they can react quicker as artisanal miners can because they don't have to go through compliance steps. Silence. <laughs> well, uh, if I can start to answer that a little bit on the, um, say, with, with my interest, say, in fertilizers and, and potash in particular. Um, there is room for both, there's no doubt about it. Um, the, um, uh, what, what is useful is to look at the way in which small-scale mining, privately owned companies, uh, aggregates of artisanal miners, for example, uh, could come together and help make all the difference for subsistence farmers. And once you start to get that right, subsistence farmers start to become trading farmers and the economy starts to grow. Jeffrey Sachs knows all about this and knows that the way to get a country right is to sort out its soil. So that is something which I think is there. The critical thing, of course, is that in order to have a venture like that in New Yorkshire with serious minerals, you have to be able to raise a huge amount of capital and you have to have a return on that capital and no one would begrudge anyone that. The, the two need to be together and it's 
as we heard, if it's de demand-driven, then we have to remember that the demand can be met in a number of different ways, potentially, and perhaps the conventional large public company route is not necessarily the first port of call for some parts of the demand. I hope that's clear. Any other comments on that, on that point? I'm Thanks. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, as someone who's, who works for one of the major mining companies, I mean, I would strongly agree with the, the point um, around there being a role for these, these smaller miners. I mean, we've, we're coming out of a period of five years where commodity prices have been quite deflated and uh, large mining companies have been making relatively little money. Um, and we've really struggled to, to find money to invest in, in new projects. Um, and in making that, that capital allocation selection, we're going to, to back the things that probably have the lowest risk, in fact. So, you know, some of the, you know, the, the normal uh, suspects in the room, it's iron ore or copper or, or some of these big things. The, the smaller um, materials that, that we've heard about this morning, they're probably still too risky um, with the, the five to ten year outlook that we've got around some of these things. You know, maybe lithium is the exception where we're starting to hear with, with Rio or, or, you know, taking quite a big position in that. But, I mean, for many of the big mining companies, they're probably going to avoid getting too involved in these things, at least at this stage in the cycle. So we're going to come back in the next session to, to thinking from a, a sort of geological and mining perspective, where are the resources going to come from, following on from our discussions here, uh, largely around geology, but I think also we probably will come back into this area of thinking about different, different models, different business models, but also potentially different processing models. So certainly, Andrew will be talking about a sort of different model of what a, what a mine might be, what a mine might, might look like. So I think this, this question of that disconnect between the very rapidly evolving demand and the, the very the long and apparently increasing timescales to get big mining operations up and running is, is quite a challenge we might come back to. Speaker, just behind, sorry, you go behind you and we'll come back down to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just wanted to touch on this idea of data um, and sort of how its lack of availability is hampering our understanding. Um, it reminded me of a conversation I had um, with, with someone over the summer. Uh, he's an engineer uh, who works for Mercedes Formula One team. And he was saying about the technology within the, the company is absolutely extraordinary. And of course, it's not available in the public domain because they're in competition directly with their rivals. It's not in their interest to do that. I thought it was quite a nice analog, I guess, for maybe the mining industry and how maybe there's a lot of information and data inside mining companies that isn't available outside. Um, Peter sort of already touched on this um, from the public point of view in terms of the BGS and the USGS. I was just wondering whether you had any insight into how you may go about trying to get that <laughs> information public available if it's you know possible at all um, yeah just wondering on your thoughts about that information from the manufacturing industry is very scarce because um, they all have their substitution technologies um, future technologies, that's all in their drawers. Anything of what you could dream of. But they, don't, they won't make it public because of this competition issues. And it was very difficult to actually get this study that we published last year, uh, Raw Materials for Future Technologies, uh, to, be, to, be, to, 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 to get this, to, to, get, to get all the information together, which was basically done by Fraunhofer, but also for them it was quite difficult to interview companies, you know, about various published technologies and so on. On the other side, mining companies are, they are, are their information is by nature uh, very public because they're compiling everything in their in their um, uh, reports for the stock exchanges, all the reserve resource calculations. I mean, they want to sell their projects, and uh, so that is very much in public, and that is screened by 
by also commercial uh, statistical companies, um, you know, what capacity, future capacity will, will reach the market in five, ten years' time or whatever. So, um, so we have much better information on the supply side and the future development, the supply side, than we have on the demand side. That's, that's very much our experience as well at BGS, that, that we have reasonably good dialogue with the, the extractive sector. But the, the manufacturers, well, they look at us a bit, I think, I think Peter's a bit further down the road than we are. I mean, they look at us a bit like the creature from the Black Lagoon, you know, who the hell are you, you know? Um, what do you know about our business? Um, some of them are... Uh, uh, one of the challenges we're having, if I'm just talking UK terms for, for a minute, one of the big challenges we have in this country, UK is a big manufacturing... You know, rumours of the demise of the UK manufacturing are, are, are greatly exaggerated. But most of our volume manufacturing is foreign-owned. So all the, all the big automotive manufacturers... Uh, the decisions about materials are not generally made in the UK. They're made somewhere else. They're made in Germany or they're made in Japan or they're made in Korea or wherever. Um, the only set, it's quite telling, the only sets we've had a, a good dialogue with really have been defence and aerospace. And that's because both the big British, both big companies who operate in the UK are British owned. There's BAE Systems and, and Rolls Royce. But it's exactly what Peter said. You can get so far with them and then. It all comes down. They just won't tell you things. What we tend to find is it's very one way. They're really, really interested in getting as much information as they can from us. And we get very little back from them. <laughs> I hope there's nobody from Rolls-Royce in the room. Um, <laughs> and, and if we get, we, we're not allowed to talk about it. Yeah, that's right. That's the other thing. So, yeah, you, 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 yeah. Um, for, for obvious reasons in defence, you know, you you're, you're quite, we do do some work for them, but we're not allowed to talk about it. And yet, despite this competitive environment, it's kind of counterintuitive that if you're wanting to do essential work to provide the resource, the, the raw materials that those industries are going to need, and they're not giving the information that they yeah, need. Yeah, I, I, enable. I don't, I don't think they always see it that way. I mean, they've they've lived in a world where the market's provided, yeah, and they. The other thing is they tend to be very focused on their sector, so they know, they'll know, what they, I mean, Rolls-Royce know what GE are doing, but they, they don't necessarily know what Toyota are doing, and that, of course, might impact on their ability to access particular raw materials. The other thing about defence and aerospace is, uh, Peter's probably going to contradict me, they don't much care about how much things cost. They're much more interested in how available they are. You know, the cost of of a few grams of rhenium in a, in a, in a, in a, in a Trent engine is, is very tiny, but you can't make that Trent engine work without the rhenium. So, so they are, they're very, they're much, defence and aerospace are much more interested in, can we get this in, can we get this now, can we get it in 25 years' time? Because when you certify a Trent engine, you certify the whole engine, you don't certify the parts, certify the whole engine, which means in 25 years' time, if you want to change a turbine blade, it's got to be exactly the same composition as the one, the one that's on it now. If you're talking to the automotive sector, my limited interaction with them, they know nickel and dime what every single part costs, because it's very much about cost. <coughs> thinking about those barriers and, and thinking ahead to the very modest challenge we've set ourselves for the discussion tomorrow afternoon of what might a roadmap for meeting the future minerals challenge look like and who do we need to enlist and engage in that actually that that idea of the the industrial consumer and thinking about that the demand end uh, of industry rather than the supply end of industry would be one of those potential partner partners that you need to you'd want to involve in that in that effort you had a comment you were going to make some minutes ago just, I think it's just, working, yeah. just following. I think if you talk in, into the top of it, I think it should work. Just following on from. I'll just shout. <laughs> uh, just following on from the uh, the discussion that we've had. One of the interesting things is communication. Who who do we communication communicate all these facts to that we've been discussing? Obviously, <clears throat> here we're preaching the, to the converted. But uh, following on from uh, Professor Manning's. Uh, mention of you know the you know the supermarket is a, a 
mine, that's one of the things that I would have thought um, the way forward, if you like, or a goal or it should be achieved is how we communicate uh, what's going on in the minerals industry, uh, uh, especially going forward. So how are, we, how, are we going to, how are we going to do that? And I would have thought that the, the, the potential change from petrol-based cars to electric cars might be a way in because it's going to affect a huge number of people, virtually everybody. That's, so is that something that has been thought about in terms of communicating um, aspects of the discussion we're having? Because clearly it's not just about the industry itself. There are many different ways of doing this, and I think that is something we, we need to bear in mind, that um, the way we communicate has to be very diverse. So uh, those of us who work in the university sector have a wonderful opportunity to work with our students. And of course, when you work with your students, you, you may reach their parents if they say anything to their parents, or you may not. Uh, the National Environment Research Council had a fantastic event last weekend in Dynamic Earth in Edinburgh which was about their work. Uh, BGS was there, as, uh, as were many of the universities. Um, the um, horde of under fives descended like a plague of locusts on the unsuspecting researchers on the Sunday, and their parents were sucked in behind them. So, so that, that, there are things like that that can be done uh, wearing an academic hat. But equally, I think the, the Geological Society has an important role to play in this as well. Uh, but I don't think it can do it on its own, and, uh, because, as you say, the preaching to the converted bit is part of this. Now, um, one of the things the Geological Society has done is uh, reach quite a wide public through the London Lecture Series, which I believe is planned to go outside London, isn't it now? Yes, it's now the public lecture series. Yes. So so, yeah. um, <laughs> and and that, that is all part of this, but there's so much more that we can do. Um, we may need to seek some help, I think, in finding how best to communicate these matters. But all these, little, all these individual little things all help. I mean, if you go away from here and tell your friends about mining when you go to the supermarket once a week, then that's, that's a start. I mean, it, it, it goes on from there. I don't know if anyone else can comment about how better to achieve what we've just agreed we need to do. No, I mean, I, I would add one dimension. I, th I think um, targeting industry and the intermediaries is absolutely critical in terms of um, scale and their market influence. But I do also think in terms of information and messaging, you need to go one step beyond that to the consumer. Um, if you look at where most, you know, some of the quite well-developed supply chain mechanisms have, have come about, whether it's uh, around blood diamonds, the emergence of the Kimberley process, or uh, similar issues, conflict minerals and better gold uh, initiative, uh, or whether it's around fair trade coffee and <laughs> good, good standards and sustainable production, it's consumers that, um, in many cases, have taken the decision that they, they, they don't want uh, those materials in their products. And you may well see a similar thing happening in the future around plastics and plastic <coughs> packaging. Um, I think the supermarkets have a very large role to play there, but it will be driven by feedback from consumers um, because that's the driver. It's profits, it's market share. Um, so understanding who occupy, occupies which bit of the system and what, you know, what their core concern, their key interest is, as well as who are the big systemic players who can make policy or you know, procurement changes, whatever it may be. I think piecing those together is the, is the challenge. Um, and every bit of this conversation feeds into that. Do you, maybe one comment. Do you remember those days when on the back of the car, in the trunk, there was this sign like for UK, Germany, DE, Maybe for the e-vehicles, uh, we have a regulation to put a periodic uh, <laughs> system uh, plate on the back of the trunk and maybe a minor symbol on there <laughs> to make it a bit and more... The, and the geological map. <laughs> <laughs> and this, yes, cover the whole car with <laughs> symbols. <laughs> How do you inform consumers so that they make more intelligent decisions about purchasing? How do you tell them that within their cell phone there are 75 elements and that they are a particular agent in terms of encouraging 
the extraction of all sorts of things? <coughs> it's a very good question, and it's one that's particularly challenging for metals and minerals industries because unlike many products, um, you know, the, the, the underlying commodity doesn't come with the, the country or the producer stamped on it. It's, it's, it's hard to understand what that is and where it comes from. Um, I think there's, there's one thing is direct consumer action, another is creating a critical mass within markets. So you've seen companies like Fairphone and others um, raising <coughs> awareness and doing a lot, of, a lot of work in this space and a, and a wider conversation emerging around conflict minerals and, you know, is your phone a conflict phone? Um, you've then seen decisions further down the supply chain. Um, Apple, for instance, announced that it wants to uh, source all of its uh, materials from secondary sources at some point in the future. It hasn't said how it's going to do that or Good when. Well. Um, and it's, uh, it, but it also seems to have completely bypassed um, the metals and minerals industry. No one is talking about this as a, as a, serious, um, as a serious threat or a serious challenge. I think just creating the conversation and planting those seeds is, is of great value. Um, how exactly you do it in every circumstance, that's a whole other science and a whole other conversation. Yeah. Well, I have one thought about that. I mean, we are all ambassadors. We talk to people, whether it's in the supermarket, over dinner, and so it goes on. And it's whether or not we're actually prepared to engage in those conversations, which for some are uncomfortable. And also information and online conversations. I mean, I think there's a big generational shift. Um, I think people are more aware and they think about um, their consumption choices, their dietary choices. I can point to many people um, in my peer group who, who have significantly reduced meat consumption, for instance, because of the obvious interlinkages with climate change and deforestation. But I probably can't point to many people in my parents' generation who would say that. It's, it's not on the radar. So I think there is a, a, an online information and a, and a wider sort of communications issue, the way people interact, uh, getting those messages out. We're going, we're going to have a couple of opportunities to come back to those topics of, of um, uh, responsible sourcing and then engaging the, the public in uh, tomorrow. Francis is going to be talking about responsible sourcing. And then I think when we come to think about, again, the, who do we engage in this effort. Thinking about how we engage public audiences is going to be a major topic tomorrow afternoon. Um, Francis and Catherine both had comments to, to make, I think. I'll leave mine for tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> okay. I wasn't trying to shut that down. Catherine. Well, mine was about engaging policy makers, which is something we haven't really talked about, but that's vitally important. And if I go back to the rare earth elements, it's really interesting that in China, of course, decisions on the rare earths were made essentially at a national level, whereas elsewhere, it's driven essentially by the markets. And in Europe, there's been a huge amount of EU funding put into the rare earth elements. And that included an expert group, Ericon, which reported a couple of years ago, and it made some recommendations. And one of those recommendations was that there were certain actions that had to be taken by the EU if they wanted a supply of rare earth elements in Europe. And none of those recommendations were taken up. And in fact, now if you talk to anybody <coughs> involved in rare earth exploration in Europe, they'll say that they are mired in political difficulty, which means it's many years, if at all, before there will ever be a rare earth mine in Europe. Because policymakers haven't caught on to the fact that this could be something really important, and are quite happy that all the rare earths are coming from China. So we can talk about this sort of thing a lot, but how do we actually communicate that message to policymakers and, and get them to, to take it on board better than we're managing at the moment? I, I, think, large, I'm, I think I'm going to leave that question hanging. I think it's an absolutely <laughs> key question. <laughs> Yeah, this I is have exactly an answer what we're going to. Gonna, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll let Peter comment because he's not going to be here tomorrow. But this is exactly, I think, what we'll want to come back and focus on tomorrow <laughs> afternoon. Peter, please do comment. When it hurts, they go to act. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only then. So, <laughs> partly the reason I really rudely shut down the, the panel responding to that now is I, I'd like to come back to it tomorrow afternoon. But also, I've got one more thing that I wanted to throw in before I hand over to Edmund to chair the next session and for Richard's talk. There's been mention of China, of course, again and again this morning, and uh, a number of people, particularly you, Sean, saying 
uh, you know, we need to work with China on this. I'm talking about China-EU collaboration and so on. Again, in terms of where we go and who we need to engage, we can come back to this tomorrow afternoon. But while we're thinking about these global supply and demand trends, other than keeping saying, you know, well, we need to talk to China, is, is there action going on on that? Are there things we should be doing? Are there particular blocks there? I mean, I, I hear China talked about at all sorts of things I go to as a sort of an other, something that's out there, mm -hmm. as if it's really very hard to talk to China, whatever China mm -hmm. is. It is it's a challenge, you know. Uh, I mean, I've done a bit of traveling in Africa recently, and it's very noticeable, you know, compared to when I first started working in Africa 30 years ago, how visible the Chinese presence is there now. There's a lot of rubbish talked about China. China are only doing what, what, what we did in the West 100 years ago. Um, and they're, they're doing what they're following a standard development model. They're trying to go up the value chain. You know, they, they don't want to sell you rare earth oxides. They want to sell you a hard disk drive or preferably a computer or a car. Um, so I don't, we do need, you know, they're, they're, they're a, a material superpower. And you can't do anything without taking them into account. Dialogue's difficult. Getting information out of China, in our experience, again, is very difficult. Getting data out of China is very difficult. Um, but on the other hand, there are many conferences in China. There are many opportunities to talk to our Chinese colleagues. We should take them. So, yeah, I mean, I think... So, th I mean, this is, this is an area that we, that we work extensively in, and I think it's useful to set it in its wider context. Uh, China's seen an exponential growth um, story, and it's uh, quite a remarkable economic development story, and the, the rate of learning and the rate of growth um, is unprecedented. And engagement in international policy processes is, um, is, is developing to, to, to match that slowly, and I think we see very, very clear signals around climate change, for instance. I mean, the G2, the, the US-China relationship, was absolutely key to unlocking the Paris Agreement. Um, the US-Germany uh, relationship was probably the, the actual economic engine in terms of creating the policy conditions and creating the manufacturing capacity to bring about solar PV and much of the renewables um, uh, transition. It's a really, really sharp learning curve, and it's something that we've engaged with various Chinese state actors on in how you carve out a, a role for China and find an appropriate role for China, um, and how it can work with international actors in different areas of the resources um, landscape. So where secure, um, resilient resource supplies are concerned, for instance, the China, uh, China is not part of the International Energy Agency, so it doesn't, it's not part of the OECD, so it doesn't benefit from emergency response mechanisms for oil, um, is just one example. Um, it's building up its own strategic stockpiles and it has an association agreement with the IEA, and there's moves to deepen collaboration, but data sharing and tech collaboration, they do represent constraints, and there's a lot of confidence building that has to be done there. Um, where commodities and metals markets are concerned, you, you can see a, you know, increasing Chinese positions in most uh, major metals trading, uh, commodities markets. Actually, in response to where most of the European and North American um, investors have actually exited those spaces where they've seen regulatory risk in having uh, physical metals holdings, uh, utilities holdings. So they've stepped into that space and are looking for dialogue. Um, and equally on the ground, sustainable um, resource production. Certainly, in my experience, um, Chinese companies are asking, how can we get up the learning curve? We recognize that we've made some tremendous mistakes um, in our going out strategy. It's, it's a 10 years up and out kind of a, a rapid scale up. And I think the conversation is evolving to equate um, these risks of, when I say stranded assets, I don't mean in the carbon terms, in the classic terms, because of conflict or license revocations. Many of these have come about where there have been labor disputes around mines in Zambia, for instance, or um, environmental transgressions in Gabon elsewhere, and licenses have been pulled. So I think um, 
certainly within the mining sector and within uh, many of the oil and gas actors, they can point to these mistakes and also the fact that they rushed out and bought assets at the very height of the market. So, it, you know, that, that, that doesn't make great business sense. But they can see it hitting their bottom line and their profitability, and they are trying to engage in these spaces. So the Ministry of Commerce in China um, has been working with the OECD, JZ and others, to develop um, outbound investment <laughs> guidelines. Um, there, there are, there's lots of thinking about collaboration and standards, but it's, it's a massive, massive, massive capacity challenge. So finding, you know, breaking down some of the quite binary um, divisions or, or um, uh, perspectives on uh, what China is and how it interacts in global resource markets and understanding where those mutual areas of cooperation are um, and supporting that, that learning pathway, I think, is really, really important. Thank you very much. I think we bring this to a halt now. Um, I'm aware the conversation is still in full flow, but as you'll gather, we'll have plenty of opportunities to pick this up over the next day and a half. So uh, I'd like to thank our, our speakers from this morning and also our, uh, our, our new panelist, uh, Andrew, in addition to you for joining us back here after your talks. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>